Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 10278 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on cash back for communities. Could members who wish to speak in this debate please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Kenny McCaskill to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you have 14 minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate as the opportunity to celebrate the enormous impact of this government's unique approach to taking money seized from criminals and companies that traverse the law through the proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and investing it into Scotland's young people and their communities through the Cash Back for Communities programme. And I'd like to draw the Chamber's attention to the first national uh, evaluation of the Cash Back for Communities programme that covers the period April 2012 to March 2014, which was published earlier this week. This money, stripped back from those who choose to adopt a criminal lifestyle, is channelled into Cash Back for Communities to deliver a wealth of free sporting, cultural, youth work educational and employment activities and opportunities for young people up to the age of 25. Cash buy not only gives young people something positive and enjoyable to do, but it helps reduce crime and antisocial behaviour by diverting the small minority who cause trouble away from such behaviour. Not all young people stray and most of them thrive on simply having something new and fulfilling to do things that are fun and healthy, that keep them occupied, tap into their interests and bring out their full potential. I launched the Cash Back for Communities programme in January 2008, and this Parliament debated in May 2009 the significant early progress made through our investment of £13 million in those first 18 months. That heralded the start to this Government's innovative vision to invest criminals' money for the benefit of Scotland's future by investing in our greatest assets, our young people. Since the launch, more than £50 million has been spent or committed, which has delivered more than 1.5 million free activities and opportunities for young people and communities in every local authority area, from Greenock to Selkirk, from Stornoway to Lerwick, and from Peterhead to Port Patrick. All of Scotland has benefited. This has involved thousands of projects covering sports, culture, youth work, educational, personal development, employment training and state-of-the-art sporting facilities. Projects that give young people the opportunity to develop new interests and skills in a safe, fun and supported environment and, of course, dissuades them from straying into trouble. We know that anti-social behaviour and crime afflict every community, but some are harder hit than others, which is why all cashback projects first and foremost focus activities and communities in areas where there is greatest need. However, every young person in Scotland, regardless of their race, religion, background, gender or where they happen to live, should get the opportunity to benefit from cashback. And I'm convinced that our young people and communities are our greatest strength and fundamental to a successful Scotland. That's why this government has now delivered on its commitment to expand cash back for communities into the next three years by committing a further £24 million of criminals' money to take us to an unprecedented level of investment of over £74 million. The money seized from criminals through the outstanding work of the police, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal's Office and the Scottish Court Service is being channelled back into communities where it's needed. That's why we've reinvested over three million back into the recovery process to enhance capacity to continue to hit criminals hard in their pockets. Through more recent larger proceeds of crime recoveries, we expanded the programme to over 50 million through to 2013-14, providing the opportunity to widen the scope and breadth of cash bag. The sports programme was widened to provide more opportunities for young people to try something different, including investing 336,000 in badminton, 316,000 in hockey, 149,000 in tennis, 
228,000 in squash, 228,000 in athletics, and 359,000 in boxing equipment and training. The well-known high visibility, high participation, football, basketball and rugby activities remain a core element of the programme because they provide important diversionary activities. The cashback sports programmes have provided over 1.1 million such activities since 2008, which has undoubtedly contributed to the factors that have seen a 75% fall in youth offences and the 52% fall in youth crime and in so doing continue to tackle breaking the cycle of youth offending in our communities. I want to say something about supporting the grassroots development of Scottish sport. The £15 million cashback sports programme is much more than the provision of diversionary activities. It also provides sustainable positive development pathways for young people through schools of rugby, schools of football and basketball coaching programmes. Young men and women across the country are improving their educational attainments, getting healthy, competing at regional level and national level, getting coaching qualifications and putting something back into the sport as volunteers or cashback sports development coaches to bring the next generation of youngsters on. Young people like Daniel Meadows, Meadows who as a youngster got involved in cashback rugby sessions, progressed to get coaching qualifications and is now the full-time cashback rugby development officer for the Shetland Isles. With just under a month to go under the Glasgow Games uh, Open, it is important if we're to secure our legacy ambitions from the Commonwealth Games and encourage more young people to be active and enjoy the many benefits that this brings, that there are the sporting facilities in the communities where they're needed. The development of grassroots sports through cashback activities has been supported by the provision of quality... By all means. Duncan McNeil. Cabinet Secretary, could he, could he give us some information about how many additional young people from poorer areas are now participating in sport than previous to the cashback scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll do my best to answer that uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, summing up. I don't have the specific figure to mind, but as I said at the outset, as has been reinforced to our credit by Alison McInnes, we do believe that cashback should prioritise those who suffer, but equally, it is something that should be available for every youngster, irrespective of their background or postcode. So we welcome, as I say, the action that's been taken. Cashback has worked with the Scottish football authorities, Scottish rugby and Sports Scotland in designing and providing over 10 million to 93 projects across 29 local authorities. 31 full-sized all-weather 3G pitches have been delivered with cashback support. Only yesterday in Aberdeen, I announced the six new full-size 3G pitches in Aberdeen, Dundee, Cumnock, Troon, Paisley and Linlithgow. However, we know that not every young person is a sports fan, which is why we also invested over £10 million in core youth work, expanded dance, music and film opportunities through the £2.25 million Cashback Creative Identities Project, and we also piloted new projects like the £2.25 million Inspiring Scotland Community Assets Link-Up pilot, the £300,000 Angus Council Just Play pilot, the £1.6 million Princess Trust Personal Development Partnership pilot, the £300,000 Princess Trust Employability Awards, and the £258,000 Clyde College and Scottish Power Power Skills Project. This is a reflection that Caspact is much more than high visibility mass participation activities. And I want to highlight the significant work being done by the likes of the uniformed organisations who through Youth Scotland's 2.6 million cashback funding have supported some 6,000 volunteers who have provided over 433,000 volunteering hours to the various uniformed organisations. The cashback partnership with Clyde College and Scottish Power drills down and focuses on individual young people to get them off the streets and re-engaged in mainstream further education, get accredited training in engineering and get into apprenticeships, jobs and further full-time education. Young people like Lee Perkins, who completed the Cashback Power Skills programme and successfully advanced into the Scottish Power Pre-Apprenticeship programme. The independent report that was published earlier this week examines the way in which cashback projects are changing individual young people's lives for the better 
and how that is being captured to provide a national picture of the overall impact of cashback. I am delighted that both the National Evaluation of the Cashback for Communities programme and the case study brochure Cashback for Communities Investing in Scotland's Young People highlight that significant impact is being delivered. The report rightly recognises cashback as a unique approach to investing proceeds of crime money. The initial stages allow testing of new ways of engaging with young people through an innovative model using a strong sports, cultural and youth work focused approach to deliver diversion activities. And this approach brings together a fantastic cashback partnership of a range of our national organisations such as Creative Scotland, the SFA, Youth Link, Scottish Sports Futures, Uniformed Organisations, Inspiring Scotland, the SRU and Basketball Scotland. And I'd like to express my continued thanks for their significant contribution and moreover, the local community volunteers they work with, making cashback the huge success that it is. I want to say something about the scale and reach of the impact that the evaluation report has highlighted. We have established the cashback model, expanded its reach and strengthened the programme to support project partners to continue to deliver investing in every local authority area and providing a quarter of a million activities and opportunities year on year for young people, regardless of their gender, race, religion, background or where they live. Significant progress has been made by cashback projects to rise to the challenge of tuning into and delivering on 27 real life changing outcomes around increasing participation, engagement, diversion and protection and on progression pathways for participating young people to ensure that youngsters get the opportunity to develop their potential and attain accredited learning qualifications and get into volunteering, training and jobs. The case study brochure tells insightful and deeply personal stories of some individual young people who have grasped the opportunities offered by all means. John Pentland. So you said that some of the cashback money was getting used for uh, supporting volunteers uh, to support the uniformed officers. Can you tell me what kind of uh, support that these volunteers are giving officers and what duties are doing? Cabinet no, Secretary. What, we, what we're referring to is that we're giving money to the uniformed organisations. Initially, they could apply for whatever they was, and I've seen people take either IT equipment or indeed some of the B-Boys Brigade took a, a, a musical equipment for their bands. Equally, we've been trying to support them in leadership programmes so that those who are baby going off to university, going into work who might normally have left the organisation, are actually supported to come back. Because what we want to see is that virtuous circle. Those who have actually benefited from the enjoyment that they got as young youngsters coming back to give back to youngsters and a younger generation following on. But obviously, I would always pay tribute to those in whatever capacity, whether it's football, rugby, sporting, cultural or youth organisations who give their time as volunteers. We should be extremely grateful for what we do. Our funding supports them. It certainly doesn't fund them. And I think we have to recognise the great contribution that they make unfunded. So as I say, that's why we welcome that. It is clear that cashback changes young people's lives for the better and sets them up to reach their potential. That a great deal of progress continues to be made and that the impact of significance for the young people and communities involved goes on. However, there's fine tuning uh, that can be done and will respond to the recommendations of the independent report to continue to invest proceeds of crime money to build on what cashback is delivering uh, for Scotland's young people and their communities. I can say to Margaret Mitchell that whilst we're not supporting her amendment, I am happy to meet and discuss the particular points she raised. I think I can give her an assurance that the Serious Organised Crime Task Force would always seek to take that on board, but I'd be happy to meet with her to pass back, and indeed it might be that it would be an opportune moment at some stage for her to perhaps deal with some of, the, uh, uh, some of those who lead some of the strands in the Serious Organised Crime Task Force to both clarify what they are doing, but indeed to take on board ideas that she may have for them. And in that, I'm conscious of time, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would simply welcome the progress of the cashback scheme and move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Graham Pearson to move, move, uh, sorry, speak to and move amendment 10278.1. Mr Pearson, around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I do move the, the amendment as stated. Uh, first of all, can I begin by indicating that uh, Scottish Labour does support the message that the profits created by criminal conduct across Scotland should be seized and returned to the communities from which they were stolen in the first place. Uh, that is why, at the UK level, uh, 
Labour supported the introduction of proceeds of crime legislation in 2002, and we were fully committed to the various developments which has led to where we are today. But I think it is a opposite that we should take time now to discuss whether or not cashback delivers as effectively and in a way that we would seek for the future. And in that context, I'm very pleased to contribute today. The Cabinet Secretary indicated to a question earlier that he didn't have specific figures uh, to justify some of the successes he claims in connection with the uh, cashback uh, formula. Repeated uh, freedom of information requests in relation to the successes and the outcomes delivered by cashback have been very difficult to pursue through the system and responses have been delayed and obscure in describing the successes that we would all like to laud in the future. So in that regard, although we support the underlying measures which have been introduced by the government, we would like to see a sharpening of, of focus to ensure that those monies that are recovered from criminals are indeed directed with best effect to those who might benefit uh, in relation to cashback. And I hope that the Cabinet Secretary can indicate that we have uh, supported a major part of the motion that the Government has put forward. Uh, he mentioned that the scheme is unique, uh, but I would uh, remind him that in 2006, the then Labour administration uh, had a very similar scheme. Uh, it had the engaging title at that stage of reinvesting the proceeds of crime. And it's described uh, as support for local projects aimed at reducing crime, improving people's quality of life, and visibly repairing the harm caused to communities through the impact of serious and violent crime. So that notion that, that cashback was an innovative scheme introduced by this government, it would have been perhaps more humane to acknowledge that it is a development of an earlier edition of a similar scheme, uh, then led by Cathy Jameson, who was the Justice Secretary at the time. Uh, when that scheme was introduced, there was, at a UK level, uh, discussions across the country about how such uh, assets might be used. England and Wales took a very different approach to the approach here in Scotland, and agreed that monies that had been liberated from, from criminal sources could be filtered through to the police service, the serious organised crime agency, revenue customs, and even the prosecution authorities. Um, I can tell them from first-hand experience of that process that a great deal of professional time and a great deal of budget attention was spent trying to ensure that each of these agencies got their fair share of assets that were recovered from criminals. Instead of the approach that is taken here in Scotland, and I'm so pleased that the current government followed through in the approach that looked to direct assets recovered from criminals to the communities that they initially came from. So to that extent, cashback has delivered. And we are keen to continue to support that delivery. Uh, and it would be good that the government acknowledge that they have the support of those in opposition benches. But we do want to see where does the money go and what does the public, what do communities get back from that uh, delivery? The Scottish Football Association and the Communities Cup get £7.1 million over five years. But roots out of prison get 500,000. Scottish rugby get 3.6 million. Uh, just play 310,000. The international development was given 1.5 million pounds. Uh, and at the same time, the fiscal service and police, 3 million pounds. The important thing from my perspective is it's difficult to ascertain what benefits actually accrued. We can see the activities, we know of the numbers that engage with it, but in understanding that it was the best outcome that was achieved by the investment of these sums in such a factor, that's what we need to be able to review and share with the Scottish public. 
I'm happy to. Thank you. Maureen Watt. Uh, I thank Graham Pearson for giving way. Does he not accept that a lot of the activities funded by cashback are diversionary activities in the evening and the twilight, and that children are not then hanging about the streets and liable to be uh, indulging in uh, antisocial acts, if you like? And that has, we have seen as a result a reduction in crime figures. Graham Pearson. Uh, well, I, I said that we do welcome the investment in such developments. It's the interconnection between those activities and the reduction in crime figures that we would want to best understand if we were to know where best to direct these various sums, which communities, at what time and in what circumstances. Uh, so in that context, we would like to see a greater rigour on the part of the Cabinet Secretary in stretching his officials to ensure that that evidence is gathered where it exists so that we can make a judgment for the future about the a disbursement of funds across Scotland. The other point that uh, I would bring to the attention of the Cabinet Secretary is that there seems to be a change, uh, and a very recent change, in some of the policies attached to those uh, assets recovered. And at, at some difficulty, I achieved access to correspondence which indicates that as far as the funding obtained in relation to proceeds of crime, that some of that funding uh, is to be allocated to Police Scotland and wherever possible the receipts are to be allocated to operational policing activity within local communities and for maximising future recoveries in line with the principles agreed at the serious organised task force meeting held on 10th February. Problem is we can't get access to the minute of that meeting and know what those principles were. But what I do know is that the Scottish Police Authority, it would appear, acknowledges the, the inclusion of estimates of anticipated receipts for 2014-15, 2015-16. So some of the assets that are recovered won't be going back directly to communities. They will actually be used to supplement the work of the police and the prosecution authorities. And I believe that that allocation of, of money in that way will change the behaviour of those services in pursuing further receipts uh, that might come in the future. Now, that on the face of it, uh, and I can see a colleague nodding in the, the back benches, might seem a laudable outcome. Unfortunately, the experience in England and Wales, and having spoken to many professionals uh, in England and Wales, indicates that uh, the kinds of work that they pursue is more attent attentive to maximising their receipts rather than the receipts that go into the common good. And eventually, more money is spent in professional time attracting monies from these assets to various services. I'm happy. Christine Graham. It's just to, uh, to say to the member, does he agree that in 2012-13, the police received 0.7 million and uh, COPFAS 0.2, which was specifically allocated to identifying and recovering the proceeds of crime. So there are figures, and it's a very narrow amount that is given for a very specific um, outcome. Graham Pearson, I'll give you time back for the intervention. Thank you. Uh, that is an, an accurate uh, description of, of what's happened in the past, but those numbers are growing. And I think that the figures that were quoted for future development is six million. And that six million will be assets that otherwise would have gone into the kinds of projects that the Cabinet Secretary has already described as being a very effective use of funds uh, liberated from, from criminal assets. So I raise in the Chamber a concern that we have a public service which is independent, which should op 
I am happy to take the intervention. I, Cabinet can give, I can give the member an assurance that that is not going to be the uh, outcome. I am grateful for his concern, though, because I do have a copy of the Aberdeen Press and Journal, 25th January 2012, and I appreciate the member was not there, but it quotes opposition MPs have thrown their weight behind Grampian Police's top police officer who is in favour of using money seized from criminals to help fund hard-up forces. That was supported by Labour Justice Spokesman Richard Baker. It was opposed by the Government. That is still our position, but I am glad that Labour are now taking our position. Graham Pearson. Uh, can I say that I always find it uh, soul-destroying when we want to dig back into the past to look what we were doing yesterday. What I thought we were discussing is what we are doing today and what we are doing in the future. So the notion that I am putting forward to the Chamber is that I think the principle of using money recovered from criminal sources to uh, pay for police officer time and for prosecution time is a, a way forward that I do not support. I think that those services should be paid for from public budget and in so doing we can ensure that they will maintain a focus on the delivery of justice and delivering on the interests of community and not focused on trying to maximise receipts in, in their own benefit. Now, I think that that's a very human outcome, and anybody who would suggest otherwise eh, ignores the reality of the way these things work in difficult economic times. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to reconsider whatever the principles were that were decided on the 10th of February at the task force meeting and um, urgently reconsider whether or not monies that should go back to communities are to be sent to these authorities. And I would also ask him, would he release information in a more effective fashion in the future so that we can know what is being done in our name? Presiding officer, I thank you for your time. Many thanks. I now call in Margaret Mitchell to speak to and move Amendment 10278.2, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The motion states that since 2008, 74 million of funds have gone to the Cash Back for Communities programme, which has provided funding of £1.5 million for positive activities and opportunities for young people in Scotland. This is clearly to be welcomed, especially as the programme sees proceeds of crime being targeted at those young people most at risk of turning to crime and antisocial behaviour. So the sport, cultural, mentoring and early years projects, which the scheme funds, provide a choice for young people who previously may have felt they had no choice other than to gravitate to criminal activity. In practice, the programme has resulted in projects and facilities being delivered across all Scotland's 32 local authority areas. In central Scotland, projects in Lanarkshire include Badwington courses for 10 to 19 year olds, organised by North Lanarkshire Leisure and run by local coaches. The course starts on the 7th of August at the Tri Sports Centre in Cumbernauld, and the project continues for a block of 10 weeks, with sessions held in Airdrie, Wishaw, Belsale, and Shots. In addition to this, a new third generation synthetic turf football pitch has been est established at DL Park Motherwell. And in East Kilbride, the Pirates American football team gained funding in 2002 thanks to the Cashback for Communities Small Grant Scheme, which covered transport costs, additional kit, and aimed to get more kids in the East Kilbride area playing American football. Meanwhile, in Falkirk, Young offenders at the HMI Young Offenders Pullment are being encouraged to build self-esteem and confidence through a dance programme, which will result in an opportunity to perform at the Go Dance 14 event in Glasgow's Theatre Royal. So, self-evidently, a variety of very worthwhile projects are being funded through the Cashback programme. Turning now to the mechanics of how the money for cash back for communities is collected, both criminal and civil recovery powers under the Act are employed by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, working in conjunction with other relevant agencies such as Police Scotland and HMRC. Within the Crown Office, two units, the Proceeds of Crime Unit and the Civil Recovery Unit, carry out this work. 
In terms of the use of recovered proceeds, the vast majority are used to fund the Cash Back for Communities programme. The, the criteria for the allocation of money seen, seized under proceeds of crime le legislation was agreed by the Serious Organised Crime Task Force and are one, the said funding for cash back for communities, two, also funding to Police Scotland and the Crown Office to enhance recovery of proceeds or crime receipts, and three, other projects which may include community projects. Overall, it is worth noting that according to the Scottish Police Authority uh, paper issued last December, serious organised crime costs the Scottish economy approximately £2 billion per annum, with the harm it causes to local communities extending far beyond the financial implications. How However, even in the peak year of 2012-13, only 10 million was seized under the Act. Therefore, although good work is most certainly being done, more could be done to disrupt crime and in the process collect more money. Tackling this aspect is the basis of the amendment in my name, which calls for more analysis to be done to identify and follow up on crimes where the Act could be implemented in order to maximise the amount of money seized and obviously disrupt crime. So whilst it is worth stressing that police services must be sufficiently funded and not reliant on criminal money for their core activities, there is nonetheless, I believe, a case to be made for looking at the option of enabling Police Scotland and the Crown Office to make specific bids for money from proceeds of crime for identified projects. And let me be clear, these would be projects to identify more crimes which could be actively pursued under the Proceeds of Crime Act legislation. For example, specifically targeting, targeting organised shoplifting, which is a much bigger um, crime than just individual shoplifting when it's run by specific gangs. This approach would have two specific, specific and positive effects, disrupting organised crime and providing even more funds for cashback schemes. Finally, presiding officer, it is essential to ensure that collection rates are as good as they can be and it's encouraging, therefore, that further steps have already been taken in Scotland to increase and take uh, under the Act in terms uh, to increase the take under the Act in terms of the Crown Office commitment to pursue court expenses. This is to be done through civil, the Civil Recovery Union a unit, which has pledged to pursue sequestration if and when necessary, where a challenge to recovery has been made and failed. Quite simply, if an individual is sequestrated, it is much harder for them to get a house or use proceeds of crime um, to their benefit. In addition to this, tens of thousands of pounds will be recovered from court expenses. Um, it is therefore to be hoped that the suggestions made above in the amendment in my name, which I have much pleasure in moving, uh, will improve and increase the funding for cash back for community scheme at the same time as ensuring that proceeds of crime legislation is as effective as possible in its application to recover funding from those who benefit from organised crime. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary confirmation that he will look at this if I am just a little disappointed he wasn't able to support the amendment this evening. Thank you very much. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of six minutes, please. I have a little bit of time in hand for interventions, but not much at this stage. Christine Graham to be followed by Duncan McNeill. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Of course, cash back is imaginative, and as my old history teacher used to say, a very good idea. Taking money those from commit crime and putting it back into underprivileged communities. It's UK legislation, but it's not bad because of that. It's very good legislation. And I don't think we should get into a turf war about whether the Scottish Executive calling it one thing or we calling it another makes any whit of difference. The point is it works. And I'm grateful to Margaret Mitchell for talking about how the process operates, because it deals with criminal and civil matters. But something that hasn't been mentioned is that if you take money from criminals and you use it for good causes, they can't launder it through other 
uh, clean it up through other processes. And uh, by the way, the Justice Committee will be having a round table with the police and SEPA, because quite often the money is laundered through environmental waste disposal. So it takes it out of the system, so it's a good thing all round. Others have said millions have been invested, and again, it's good, it's primarily to activities for young people who have had a bad, not having a good start in life. Um, in my constituency in Gala, in 2011, there was a 3G synthetic pitch which got 500,000 from Scottish Borders Council, 350,000 from Cashback, and 100,000 from the Hayward Trust. Now, I don't have for Duncan McNeill or others the exact figures, but I can tell them this. There's a queue to book those pitches. So they've been very successful. And the important thing is they also meet stringent rugby headfall height conditions with a proper shock pad, which can cause uh, issues in there. And in Midlothian, the Midnight League football run by Scottish FA together with Midlothian Council, Community Safety, Bank of Scotland, Cashback, Adidas and Borders Railway of all people, had over a thousand in its first year and growing. So I do have some local numbers. I want to turn to something that is, however, missed out a bit, which is the, uh, the improvements that are being made to the proceeds of crime legislation alluded to by Margaret Mitchell there, because in June this year, proposals have been put forward to strengthen the proceeds of crime legislation to make it faster, tougher prison sentences for failing to pay confiscation orders enabling assets to be frozen faster and earlier, so presumably they can't be disposed of, and ensuring confiscation orders are in place for those who abscond before being convicted. So there's a whole range of things to speed it up, which the Westminster government, as I understand it, have accepted, and the Scottish government has also asked for other measures to be included, ensuring confiscation orders are not stopped as a result of offenders serving default sentences, creating new offences, for breach of specific orders during civil cases and establishing a role of administrators to allow more cost-effective management of property held during civil comms. These are all technical, but very, very important to make the best use of the assets that are kept. Um, moving back, I want to talk about the cashback small grant scheme, which I really hadn't paid terribly much attention to. One tends to look at the big numbers, 350,000. But very, very important are the sums that we could take under the cashback small grant scheme, which can't be more than 2,000, but can make a big, big difference to whether you have a football net that stays up, you have footballs, you have so on, you have little things that make the world of difference. And that is supporting local volunteer-led groups. Now, they can't all individually apply. That would be such a, a network of administration. But it is filtered through Clubs for Young People Scotland, Girl Guiding Scotland, Girls Brigade, Scottish Council, the Scout Association, the Boys Brigade, Youth Scotland, and a network of youth clubs. So presumably, and the Minister might tell me how that works, is that you make an application through that, you're a small club, you make the application, they put it forward to the government. And that has a substantial impact on young people. The partnership itself has a total of 6,862 groups, 170, nearly 172,000 young people supported by 26,000 volunteers. There are some numbers for you. And they're more than numbers, they're people who are doing better than they would have done without cashback for communities. And the intended cashback of this area was that young people, parents and communities feel that young people have exciting things to do other than sit and play in computer games and safe places to go for a range of activities. Now, of course, the amount that's recovered under the scheme varies year by year. It was a bumper year in 2010-11 when the total recovered was 25.9 million. That was a big figure, but that really was because of two particular cases. Weir Group and Atali Kazasnikov boosted the figures. Generally, it's not as high as that. 2003-04, it was 2.2 million. 2013-14, 8 million. I've already disclosed the figures, how that then was slightly apportioned, but simply to bring in more money and to deal with it. And I note, and I think, I can't think, know if you said it in your speech, Cabinet Secretary, but you're not intending to use all the money up in one year just because it's there, but it can be carried forward. So I think, you know, really, without carping about this, there can be nobody in the chamber who doesn't think that this is excellent legislation and that, in fact, it is a virtuous circle that the bad boys and bad girls, their money's taken from them as fast as it can, it's protected so they can't 
real, launder it into something else. It's put back into the communities. I appreciate there may be some tweaking, but all in all, across the Parliament, and I thank Westminster as well, that's the only time you'll perhaps hear me saying that in here, I think it's good legislation. Many thanks. I now call Duncan McNeill to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Deputy President Officer, and I am also pleased to take part in today's debate. And like others, uh, I have expressed an interest in the Cash Back for Communities programme for some time through FOIs, through questions in the Chamber, and indeed work on the committee. In the terms of its accountability, its outcomes, and the impact it's having on communities. And I think we will hear a lot today, and I could recite many of the good causes and the good ideas that, that, that take place in my community. I've supported their efforts to get cash back money that allowed uh, those good initi initiatives to take place. But we are discussing today the first national evaluation outcomes. That's what we're discussing, uh, discussing today. And it is uh, how cash back has been working. We all agree it's a good idea but how it's been working and how it could be made to work better, for, particularly for those communities that are hard-pressed with deprivation, poverty and associated crime. Um, so I give a qualified welcome to this long overdue evaluation programme, which is a seven years after it began, with £40, 40 million pounds already spent. And it's it's useful you know, to, to recognise that in the evaluation, it doesn't give us the, 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 the information in terms of what children were reached, which communities were reached, where the, the facilities have been set up and how will that transform that part of, of, of that community. It, it, it lumps together all of the local authorities when we know within local authority boundaries that there are extremes of crime and poverty. It doesn't give us any of that detail. So therefore, you can have a situation where the minister can stand up and say, well, it's solved crime. And it's, you know, you know, make these broad assumptions. There's nothing in an evaluation that confirms any of those assertions. So it may be, it may be a, a, a disappointment I, I would um, also make and Graeme Pearson has made about the difficulty of getting information from the various partners over a long period of time. And it may be that we ask the question, and why isn't it possible that those par partners who are recipients of millions of pounds of public money are not subject to FOI requests for that money they receive? I, I, I simply pose the question. But Inspiring Scotland began their work in 2012. The concerns that I and others have raised regarding the lack of accountability and transparency, the lack of clear and consistent object, uh, objectives in relation to the programme were confirmed, they were confirmed in this, the, this evaluation in a very nice way, but they had to begin work to, to tell people how, how they could produce effective external evaluations of their programmes. They had to explain to maybe some of the explanation could be useful in here. They had to explain to those 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 organisations the difference between inputs, the money it goes in, outputs, the, the, the impact on communities, um, and, and outcomes. They've had to explain all that. So what they found, goodness only knows. The government haven't shared that information with us. I would like to see that information. Their first report to the government placed in space for all of us to see. We need to learn lessons from the lack of financial accountability, the lack of, of, of strategy. Well, I'm not blaming these sports partners or any of that, because if you are presented by, with money as a windfall, and you're not asked to account for it very much, then well, you'll use that flexibility. I'm not saying they've done anything criminal with it, but did they use it to the best effect for the objectives that have been set out for us all to reach those communities that are more... That, that, certainly. Christine Graham. I'd, I hope you were listen, listening to my speech, but you heard me give a fairly detailed breakdown of how the funding for the 3G pitch in Gala Shields came about. And these other partners would not have entered into it unless this had been properly accountable. So I've given you an example. Duncan McNeill. We're, we're talking about an evaluation programme that should be able to write down to the postcodes 
right down to the community, right down to the individuals that have benefited from this scheme. That's what we should be able to do after seven years. We're talking about headline figures, and we're talking about organisations, even in the evaluation report, who had to be reminded that they how to produce reports, they had to be reminded about corporate governance. It's all there in, in that piece of paper, in that, in that summary report that was provided for us for the debate. And I think we deserve, as a parliament, to share the information that when Inspire looked into this, we, demand, we should demand the information that would tell us the chaos that they found. Because the list of recommendations to address all of these issues are there in front of us today, provided by the, 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 the government. It also states that cash part partners are still in an early stage of measuring the outcomes, seven years on, through their work. Surely we should have already have a comp comprehensive picture on the impact of communities. However, presiding officer, it's better late than never. And I'm glad that we are moving forward and that an appropriate accountability measures and monitoring practice practices are now being put in place. But I do not believe, as it's suggested here, that we should be drawing a line uh, between 2008 and 2012, and then just looking forward. We need to understand fully and have the full information to understand what, what, what went on in 2008, 2012, so we can understand how better we do it in the future. And I would say in closing, in all of this, it's important that we do not lose sight of the overall objective of the programme, which should be to put the process, proceeds of crime back into the communities hardest hit by crime, not spreading the jam thinly across. The, we, we are, as Graham Pearson said, we are agreed in that. Cathy Jimison, the Minister in Development of the Early Policy, said our pr proceeds of crime legislation is really beginning to bite where it hurts criminals most in their pockets. We have pledged that assets are recovered from the proceeds of Crime Act in Scotland will be used by the executive to repair some of the damage that has been done to the communities that have suffered most as a result of drug dealing and other serious uh, crimes. If we are going to be true to that, we need to change the future and how we address this issue. Thank you very much. I now call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased, like others, to be taking part in this important debate today on cash back for communities. I recall well my time in Cabinet, the discussion we had about the scheme, how it would operate in future uh, in the run-up to its launch. And uh, I remember exactly at that time thinking that the changes that were being brought forward and the concept of the scheme was Mr. exactly Crawford, could what you... we required. And I'm thank sorry you. I didn't push my microphone up earlier, but it's up now. Very thanks to my good friend, Dick Lyle. Um, I, I generally welcome the positive comments made by Graham Pearson uh, and also Margaret Mitchell in terms of the overall scheme. Duncan was his usual forensic self and effectively, despite all the noise we were having, has accepted that the evaluation report has done its work and told us where we can make improvements. Uh, but, you know, but at the end of the day, we all know uh, that at its heart, this policy is about hitting the criminals hard and using the proceeds of crime legislation, good legislation is said by Christine Graham, to get them what it hurts most for them in their own pockets. Because ultimately, it's the hardworking people across the country who pay the cost of criminality. The evaluations recognised that the investment in activities uh, and opportunities for young people who may be at risk and or of going into um, antisocial behaviour can play a key role in preventing criminality arising. Yes, Duncan McNeill. Duncan McNeill. Th thanks to Bruce Crawford. Could you tell me the difference between uh, an activity and an opportunity in the evaluation? Bruce Crawford. Well, a an activity is something you undertake, whether it's a sport, um, which, Duncan, you and I are probably sadly missing on doing more recently in our lives. An activity... Uh, is something I would encourage you to do and take some more of these anti crabbit pills as we go through life. <laughs> <coughs> Moving on, though. Uh, but there can be no doubt, though, that the, uh, investing in Scotland's young people through the cashback programme helps make our communities safer and healthier. Safer, safer because young people were encouraged to take part in constructive activity that makes it much less likely they will drift into trouble antisocial behaviour on the worst case 
committing crimes healthier. As young people are involved, for instance, in positive and exciting sporting activity that might be novel to them and keep their interest. But in saying all this, I know that it's only a small minority of young people who become involved in antisocial behaviour or, worse still, drift into criminality. But through initiatives like Cashback for Communities, we can ensure that opportunities exist for young people, providing a positive alternative to that drift. But I would say one thing to the Cabinet Secretary. I hope that over the longer term, it will be possible to estimate the economic benefit to young people and to society of such interventions. In that respect, given that the jobs and economic growth are the stated priorities of the Scottish Government, and as part of that, youth employment is critical, I wonder if the Cabinet Executive could tell us in his summing up what more can be done to bring a sharper focus to the programme in that regard. In 2008, I also remember feeling excited about what the, this unique Scottish approach could do to help the communities I represent, to help build their confidence, to help make them more resilient. And since these early days of the programme, this Cabinet Secretary has reminded us in his opening speech that the Scottish Government has delivered its commitment to expand cash back by taking the investment in the programme to over £74 million. Now, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned during his speech the role played by the police, the Crown Office, the Procurator's Fiscal's Office and the Scottish Court Service, of which I was once a part. Um, he was correct to say, I believe, that they do outstanding work. And I'm glad, uh, perhaps Mr Pearson isn't, that they, they've had £3 million more put into the recovery process to enhance capacity. That enhanced capacity will enable these organisations to target criminals even more ruthlessly. And I kind of guess that Graham Pearson would intervene at that stage. Graham Pearson. The intervention. Does he not acknowledge that in so devolving money in that fashion, it's up to £6 million less that can be invested in communities and offering the opportunities that he's just spoken of for young people and gaining employment? Bruce Crawford. Yeah, but sometimes you've got to speculate to accumulate in life, and that's what this process is all about. Make sure we put money in there to get more money back. I think it's quite a simple equation, Mr Pearson, and I think you should look at it a bit more closely. Uh, I won't suggest, though, you need to take the crabbit pills on this occasion. <laughs> no, but, but I, I genuinely believe it's the right thing to do in what, what we're doing here. In terms of sporting activities and facilities, cashback funding has enabled a wide range of programmes and activities across the Stirling area to be established, and I'm going to go through some of them because I think some of them are worth repeating. That's a midnight, mid, midnight, midnight football leagues, a street football programme and a school of football run by Active Stirling and the Scottish Football Association, a collaboration between Stirling Rugby Football Club Scottish Rugby to deliver a school of rugby, Twilight Basketball, which I know Anne Maguire uh, was very much involved in the launch of that and a applauder for it, uh, who is the local MP, obviously, is delivered by Scottish, the Scottish Sports Futures in partnership with the Scottish Council, uh, the Stirling Council, and the successful Hockey Nights programme, which is operated by uh, Hockey Scotland in partnership with Stirling Council and very effectively linked with the local um, hockey club. Cashback Bad Badminton is doing a good job. It's delivered by Badminton Scotland and Active Stirling with the idea of providing young people with activities at peak times as regards antisocial behaviour. And there's some great work going on at Stirling's Tollbooth with the City Music Project, uh, which has come also from cashback money. It offers young people the opportunity to develop their skills and knowledge in various aspects of music and the creative arts. There's a great deal of work going on. I want to commend the efforts, presiding officer, of the, Scottish, uh, of the Stirling Council's youth services, who are always able to be subjected to FOI, Active Stirling and many other partner organisations for the hard work that they are doing delivering programmes funded by the Cashbacks for Communities programme. I don't have time to go into the amount of money that's been spent in the Stirling area, though it's £800,000 over the period. Uh, but I believe, though, that the de dedication of those employed in volunteering in delivering cashback and making a huge and positive difference to the life chances of many young people in Stirling and across Scotland. And I know we will applaud what they do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by James Dornan.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a very worthwhile debate to have today, and I am very glad that the Minister has brought it to the Chamber. And I welcome the evaluation of cash back for communities. I do agree with colleagues, however, that it is a little bit late in coming and that it is still a little bit limited in content. And I would hope that in the future, the Cabinet Secretary would uh, perhaps ensure that there is more information about the numbers of young people taking part, but also about where those young people come from and what their circumstances might be. I think that would help to illuminate the entire issue. But of course, the entire premise of the Proceeds of Crime Act was that when people are convicted of crime, drug dealers and others uh, particularly, and have been apprehended and convicted, that the money they have obtained through the misery of others can be taken from them by the courts. And that the ill-gotten gains of Scotland's criminals should be retrieved in this way and used to fund good causes is something that I think we would all agree with and was, of course, the purpose of the 2002 Proceeds of Crime Act. But this debate today is a good opportunity to consider what more might be done to strengthen the system and to ensure that the best possible use of the resources that are available is made. And I hope today that we would hear from the Minister that the Scottish Government will look at ways in which it can ensure that more money is seized from criminals. So to that end, I welcome the £3 million he mentioned uh, today. But I wanted to draw the Minister's attention to a potential issue that I came across when researching for these, this debate. And I want to quote from the website of a Scottish legal firm, not untypical uh, of some other commentary that I noticed on the web um, a few days ago. And this text forms part of a section where this particular legal firm advertises its expertise in the area of confiscation under the proceeds of crime. The website says that this particular company, and I quote, always employs an expert witness, namely a forensic accountant, to examine the Crown figures. This can make a big difference both in attacking the benefit figure and in reducing the available amount figure. The Crown will engage in discussion and listen to reasoned argument to try and settle the case in a manner suitable to all parties. We were instructed in the widely reported case of a convicted drug dealer who was pursued for £150,000. Following our involvement and negotiation, a criminal confiscation order was made for the sum of £1. Now, presiding officer, I understand why the sum of £1 was identified. It is so that if other assets appear in the future, it is clear that those assets are over and above that particular confiscation order and therefore can be looked at again. And I also understand that everyone has a right to challenge the Crown. If there are errors in their calculations, then so be it. But it is the line in the quote which says, the Crown will engage in discussion and listen to reasoned argument to try to settle the case in a manner suitable to all parties that gives me pause. Do we really want the Crown to settle such negotiations in a manner suitable to all parties? Well, I don't think so. And I would hope that the Minister can assure me that the Crown is always robust in these cases and that it, the Crown, considers its role to be to settle such matters in the best interests of our communities. Presiding officer, in my view, those communities which suffer most from deprivation and which are often the communities that are most blighted by crime too, should also be the ones that benefit most from cashback. And I've made this point on a number of occasions in the Chamber. But unfortunately, that does not seem to be the case. Now, it will come as no surprise that I would argue strongly in this regard for my home city of Glasgow. And I would want Glasgow to receive a share of any funding available. But the reality is that in spite of the fact that 33% of children in Glasgow are classified as living in poverty, the highest percentage in Scotland, Glasgow doesn't even rank in the top five local authorities when this cash is being dispersed. Now, that seems to me to be fundamentally wrong. And as I said, it's a point I've made on many occasions in the past. And I would hope that in closing, the Cabinet Secretary might suggest ways in which this could be addressed. And I think this is the reason why we feel that there needs to be more content to the evaluation in future so that these kinds of issues can be uh, looked at with more seriousness. Now, having said all of that, I'm a huge fan of cashback in the communities and I'm aware of a number of projects in my constituency that have received funding from that route. And that is incredibly welcome. 
And within my constituency, the SRU, for example, has been active in 15 schools in my constituency and has taken part in many street rugby sessions in Postal Park. And I'm delighted that the SRU has been working with Glasgow Community and Safety Services, as I believe that working in partnership with local organisations is often the key to, the, to success in the kind of work that the SRU is undertaking. But I would also hope that this work can be sustained over a considerable period of time and that it isn't just part of a programme of individual sessions that are delivered, but is part of a, an organised routine of activity. And again, that is one of the areas where I think the evaluation report could be strengthened. I'm also aware of a number of local organisations that have been unsuccessful in their application for funding and who feel that they've been disadvantaged, rightly or long, wrongly, because they are local and not national organisations. And these are organisations already working on the ground who feel that other larger organisations are there, then funded to come in and do similar or the same things as they've been doing for many years. And unfortunately, when some of these organisations have gone back to cashback and have asked for feedback as to why they failed in their application, they're told that they can only have uh, information provided over the phone and that there can't be any further dialogue than that. I think that needs to be a bit more transparent, if only to explain to people why they're failing in this regard. I must ask but, you to draw to a close. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am doing. Um, I also believe that more dialogue with communities about what will work in their locality could be helpful. And I would also make a plea for the creative side of this particular fund, because it seems to me that there is less money being spent on creative projects than on sport. And while I'm a huge fan of sport, I do recognise that it isn't for everyone and that some of the creative work that is going on, which is very good, would perhaps be of more interest to more people and in that way help us to, to allow more young people to have the opportunity to be involved in the kind of diversionary and interesting activity that we all want to see. Many thanks. Before we move on, can I remind the Chamber that members shouldn't turn their back on the presiding officer and chat during speeches? I'm afraid I had to remind the Chamber of that yesterday as well. James Dornan to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, before I go on to say what I was intending to say, I'd just like to uh, challenge the, the comments made by Patricia Ferguson, unless I've misunderstood her, but on page 17 of this evaluation, national evaluation, it says that Glasgow was by far, had by, received by far the most money. It says that Glasgow received £5,382,353, the nearest being Edinburgh with just less than £4 million. So I'm not sure, unless we're talking about two completely different things, it certainly doesn't appear to me that Glasgow has been shortchanged when it comes to cash back for communities. It, like others have articulated, cash back is a great initiative, allowing us to reinvest the ill-gotten gains of crime back into the heart of communities across Scotland generally those communities most affected by the actions of the criminals involved. It's particular but not exclusive focus on helping young people who might themselves be at risk of falling into a life of crime is also to be commended. And I'm looking forward to hearing more stories about the many ways that cash back uh, money has had a positive impact in constituencies and regions throughout Scotland. I'll give a couple of examples from my own constituency to highlight the varied work that cash back for communities funds has done. But before I do that, I would, before uh, I stood up, my colleague David Torns was telling me, just as an example of how that can be, affect communities in many different ways, that £800 had been given to a local scout group for archery equipment. Not something that I suspect that many scout groups in Glasgow would be getting, but that's, that's a different matter entirely. The, the, one of the initiatives that I'm involved in, I saw the first four pages of, of this, sorry, the first two pages of this. Uh, and I was really interested in the sort of differing organisations and the way that cash back for communities, uh, uh, the funding is used. Dance base, green education, uh, a village storytelling centre, all sorts of different stories. But the one that I want to start to talk about first is the one that involves girls and women's football. Uh, girls, women and girls, girls aged 9 to 24 across the country involved in playing football in conjunction with the SFA, which is based at Hamden in my constituency. Uh, and development teams go out to schools and groups across the country to get more girls and women involved in football. And this is hugely important, as some of you might know, I sit on the board of Scottish Women in Sport, and the benefits of getting women and girls involved in sport at a young age and keeping them involved are many and varied. We know that girls and women who play sport have higher levels of confidence and self-esteem and lower levels of depression. 
This is crucial because adolescent girls in particular appear to be more vulnerable to anxiety and depressive orders and are significantly more likely to have con seriously considered suicide by the age of 15 compared to boys. Involvement in sport develops skills such as teamwork, goal setting. The yes, I will do. I will do. Patricia Ferguson. The member will perhaps, I hope, um, excuse me for going back a step, but yes. I would want to say that I agree with him entirely about women and girls' sport, and it's an issue that I think he and I have a very shared agenda on, so it's always a pleasure to hear him highlight that. However, I would just go back. Um, he moved off page 17 in the evaluation a little bit too quickly for me there. Um, but it seems to me that Scottish Borders, Angus, Shetland, Orkney all get more money per 10,000 of the population than Glasgow does, and that doesn't seem to me to be right, and I'd be surprised if Mr Dornan thought it was. James Dornan. Well, all I can say is that the figures are here in front of us. It's by far the... the no, no, no. What I'm, what I'm saying is the figures are here in front of us. There's over £5 million put to, uh, sent into Glasgow Local Authority to, to, to be dealing with cash back. There are different, er there are different areas in Glasgow than just Order, areas that, that, uh, that need this cash back money. OK, as I was saying, we go back to the, the girls in uh, sport. Involvement in sport develops skills such as teamwork, goal setting, the pursuit of excellent leadership and confidence. A study in America showed that 80% of female executives of Fortune 500 companies identified themselves as former tomboys or had played sport and all believed that this had given them the tools that they needed in order to succeed in their careers. So as well as changing attitudes to what women and girls can achieve, investing in sport will also help future generations of girls succeed in the workplace. It can be easy to dismiss funding in areas such as this. It's just something to spend money on. But this cash back for communities funded initiative is having a real impact. Investment in sport at a grassroots and young level works, and in this year of the Commonwealth Games, we have a unique opportunity to capitalise on this and help make our country healthier and happier. And it's not just football that receives cash back for communities, as others have said. Scottish Rugby run a number of initiatives, including street rugby, where they work with schools, guiding staff and the police to identify young people aged 14 to 19 with specific behavioural, social or learning needs who then take part in an intensive two to three months programme to learn to play, coach rugby and develop their leadership skills and positive behaviour. Scottish Rugby also runs development programmes in schools and facilitates visits between schools and current rugby players. Rory Hughes, Glasgow Warriors and Scotland player who went to school in Kings Park in my constituency, has visited a number of schools across Glasgow to take part in coaching sessions, including Sean's Academy. As well as offending, uh, offering opportunities in sport, Cashback also offers funding in the themes of communities, creative early years and youth work, as I highlighted earlier on with the, the examples from the, the book. It was through the youth work element of the Cashback for Communities programme that Arden Craig Housing Association and Casimal got more funding for the Teen Zone, Teen Zone Sporting programme. Teen Zone is a group of young volunteers working to encourage other young people to participate in their community using sports diversionary programmes to tackle antisocial behaviour in their area. These programmes are specifically targeted at young people who are least likely to engage in existing form of youth participation. When the sports programme came to an end, mostly I have to say because of the prohibitive prices that Glasgow City Council charged to use the local school facilities, the Teen Zone Committee, which is now 13 members strong, worked to set up Teen Zone Media Productions, who have secured a couple of com film commissions from Glasgow and the West of Scotland Forum to film its welfare reform campaign work to filming the Play in the Dark event at the Gilly Peace Club. And it goes to show that that one piece of initial funding from Cash Back for Communities can ignite a spark that can empower young people to get involved and make their communities and their prospects better. We've heard a, a, a number of the speakers talking about you know, how can we be sure that these activities are helping to solve crime. My suggestion would be that if somebody's playing basketball, if somebody's involved in some artistic uh, thing, then what would happen is they can't be playing basketball and committing crimes at the same time. Many of these activities take place on a Friday and Saturday night where many young people who would be involved would be out on the streets and then would be affected by either being the victims of crime or falling into crime, uh, criminal activity themselves. Please draw to close. I yeah, will do that. I firmly believe that Cash Back for Communities has more than proven its worth as a successful initiative that gives back to communities. How much more could have been invested in programmes that those cash back already helps if we had the power to keep all the monies from Westminster uh, from fines, which are paid back to Westminster, over £80 million in the last decade? That money could have been used, along with the money that we have available for cash back for communities, to help our communities in Scotland to be a better and safer place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we move on, can I advise the Chamber that the little bit of extra time we had at the beginning of the debate has rapidly evaporated, and therefore there's only a few seconds extra for members. 
Um, Alison McInnes to be followed by Annabelle Ewing. Thank you very much, President Officer. And I too welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate and to highlight how the Cash Back for Communities scheme is improving the lives of thousands of young people across Scotland. The motion rightly notes that many successful applicants, but by no means all, support young people at risk of becoming involved in crime, targeting areas where offending behaviour is most common. These diversionary projects enable those growing up amid difficult circumstances, disadvantage or deprivation to achieve their potential. Some realise this through education, new vocational skills or opportunities to enter the workplace. Other activities offer peer support, a chance to build positive relationships and develop interests in an informal and safe environment. But they all seek to instil self-confidence, improve social cohesion and give those who feel detached from their communities a sense of purpose and belonging. YouthLink Scotland reports that £1 invested in youth work delivers a social return worth £13. It is the most effective way to reinvest the money seized from offenders across Scotland. In my region in the North East, £5.5 million from cashback has helped establish 200,000 activities and opportunities since 2008. This has enabled Just Play in Angus to engage young children and parents from 89 families with criminal histories. Through facilitating shared play experiences and purposeful activities during the early years, Just Play builds familial bonds and ensures local children get the best possible start in life. Elsewhere, Cashback is helping Street Soccer Scotland reach people contending with mental health problems and addiction in Dundee. It's funding 3G pitches in Aberdeen, and supporting basketball teams, including the Port Lethen Panthers. And the voices of the young people themselves tell the story in this booklet. And we have voices like Mohammed Ibrahim saying, I'm not sure where I would be if I hadn't discovered Twilight Basketball. It has definitely had a real influence in my life. Or Paul Gillespie saying, the project provided me with structure and a reason to get up in the morning. I developed new social skills and built my confidence through the programme, and I found a new sense of social worth. That's very valuable work indeed. Key to the success of each initiative is the remarkable commitment of volunteers, coaches and youth workers. People across sport, art, business and the third sector dedicated to increasing opportunities for others. And of course the efforts of the Crown, the police and other agencies involved in detecting the crime, catching criminals and seizing assets must also be commended. Presiding officer, the, national, uh, the independent national evaluation of cashback for communities describes how the impact assessment, monitoring and reporting processes can be improved. And I think there's also scope to make the application process more transparent and accessible. Out with the application windows, there is little information for interested organisations. They're simply told all the money is currently allocated. And the cashback website at the moment still states that applications will be accepted until December 2013. I know this hit and miss approach has caused some frustration. The evaluation report states that annual average proceeds of Crime Act payments have been relatively consistent at around 5 million. And I know we get some high profile windfalls that can mean it's much higher. But if we can reasonably estimate what to expect, the Scottish Government could provide potential applicants with clarity on application and payout timetables, currently shrouded in, in, in some mists and, and secrecy. It could also allow applications all year round, even if the funding decisions continue to be taken intermittently. Uh, or even perhaps interested parties could subscribe to an email alert system, rather than having to regularly check an out-of-date website for details of future funding opportunities. And I do also think that local communities should be involved in identifying the needs of their children and neighbourhoods. They are really best placed to tell us where we can make a difference. One of Kenny McCaskill's first acts as Justice Secretary was to commit to using the proceeds of crime to give our young people more choices and chances, and that's to be commended. And the motion and amendments today suggest that there is continued cross-party agreement on the need to focus reinvestment upon preventing and reducing youth offending. However, the Cabinet Secretary hasn't properly addressed the fact that we, it would appear that um, some of the proceeds of crime will be siphoned off to top up Police Scotland's budget. The National Force seems set for a £10 million windfall over the next two years, following sustained lobbying by the Chief Constable. And despite Assistant Chief Constable Nicholson insisting that he needs the money to maintain community projects, Police Scotland told the SPA on the 30th of April that its intentions are to, are to use it to fund its contributions to the UK-wide National Crime Agency and to also support the management and maintenance of CCTV systems. 
Now, these strike me as routine financial commitments. They don't cohere with either the Cabinet Secretary's pledge or the ethos of the cashback programme. And we have to ask what has changed since 2007, apart from the need to meet the unfounded and unrealistic savings targets. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how many people will miss out on the opportunities as a result? I listened to the Cabinet Secretary's response to Graham Pearson earlier, and it seemed he seemed to insist this will not be the case. So therefore, I would be most grateful for absolute clarity in his summing up. Because if that £10 million that's currently identified in the SPA budget um, actually goes to day-to-day -day services rather than to cashbacks, I've estimated that about 340,000 opportunities for young people would be lost. So the, the Cabinet Secretary has also intended that he... he has also said that he intends to bolster the proceeds of crime legislation to make it faster, tougher and to crack down on criminals who avoid paying. We firmly believe these resources should continue to be used to get lives back on track and give our young people the best possible start in life. Many thanks. Um, I just want to alert the Chamber to the fact that we are now tight for time. Um, so up to six minutes, please, Annabel Ewing, to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased also to have been called to speak in this uh, debate this afternoon on the excellent Cashback for Communities programme. And as we have heard, this programme was introduced by the SNP Government in 2007 and was, uh, in fact, launched uh, the following year. And uh, also, as, as we have heard, it uh, happily involves taking money recovered from criminals under the Proceeds of Crime Act and uh, investing the sums reclaimed back into young people and the communities uh, in which they live. So it has a twofold benefit in that it provides young people with worthwhile local activities, particularly, but not exclusively, as regards sport. It also, at the same time, helps to reduce crime and antisocial behaviour by giving young people a different road to travel, rather than being caught up, as a small minority are, in causing trouble in their communities. And I believe it is working to provide a different path to take that can make the key difference to the lives of individual young people who are desperate to have real chances in their lives. Uh, it is a Scotland-wide programme, and there's been some debate about that issue this afternoon, but I think that is very important, because crime and antisocial behaviour are not limited simply to certain geographic areas. Rather, the programme does not discriminate on the basis of postcodes, but looks at the applications made in terms of need being established on a case-by-case -case basis. And that, to me, is the fair way to proceed, for surely it is accepted that there are young people in all parts of Scotland who need a chance. In terms of sporting opportunities facilitated through the programme, of course, football uh, features widely, and as alluded to by my colleague James Dornan, um, what perhaps is less common at this time, but hopefully not going forward, is that cashback resources are also relevant to girls' uh, football. And in the case of Alloa, uh, they are in fact helping to fund the only girls-specific football scheme in Scotland, which is the Girls' Football Academy at Lawrence Hill Academy in Alloa. And this is being piloted for the women's section of the SFA. And it is good to note in this respect that whilst there are certainly uh, girls participating in football in schools across Scotland, other local authorities whom I understand may have been a bit sceptical at the beginning of this project in Alloa are now considering setting up other girls' football academies. And I very much uh, look forward to that happening, uh, uh, hopefully in the years uh, to come. And also, as far as Clipmanager is concerned, another sport that has attracted funds from the cashback programme in the Wee County uh, is uh, basketball. And this is further to the unique Jump To It programme, which is supported by the cashback scheme. And this programme uh, provides education through sport initiative delivered to primary schools across Scotland by the charity Scot uh, Scottish Sports Futures. And uh, further to uh, the scheme, the Glasgow Rocks professional basketball team has educated primary uh, pupils, including over the last year, 900 pupils from 16 schools in Clipmanagshire, with information being provided on healthy lifestyles. Uh, and um, also, over 300 youngsters in the wee county uh, created more than 30 teams to compete in a regional tournament delivered by Clipmanagshire Active Schools and Sports development and four girls teams and four boys teams excitingly won the opportunity to attend a Glasgow Rocks game uh, and actually played out their finals during half time with the winners being for the girls uh, the Tillicoutry primary school team and for the boys the Abercrombie uh, primary school uh, so they were the, the crowned the jump to champions for Clipmanagshire so these uh, 
examples, I believe, represent the real stories behind the cashback programme, behind the dry statistics that some of us have got involved with this afternoon, and indeed the lengthy uh, evalu evaluation documentation. Uh, and the, the, the real story is the opportunity that is given to young people to realise their own potential. And I congratulate Manager Council for their 110% enthusiastic take-up of this uh, project and also, obviously, all the teachers and others involved in delivering uh, the same. Time today uh, now, Presiding Officer, does not permit me to go into in any detail a discussion of the other exciting projects across Perthshire and, indeed, uh, in Fife, where... I was pleased to note further to an oral question I put to the, Cabinet uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in December last year that Fife itself has benefited from more than £1.3 uh, million pounds in cashback investment and more than 55,000 activities and opportunities for young uh, Fifers. So, um, Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I would like to say what a fantastic initiative the Cashback for Communities programme is, and I believe what a credit to this SNP government for ensuring that this unique approach uh, to the scheme has been rolled out so extensively and uh, so successfully. Because in the end of the day, uh, there can surely be no more important goal in life than doing everything we possibly can to ensure that young lives are nourished and they are nurtured so that they have confidence in themselves and can indeed realise their full potential. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thanks very much. Thank you for your brevity. Now call on George Adam to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this debate and I want to talk about the many benefits of cashback for community. The very idea of money coming from those involved in criminal behaviour and investing it in our communities uh, is exciting and extremely popular with members of the public. As the Cabinet Secretary has already stated, we're, talk we're taking money from criminal, criminal money and investing it in our children and young people's future. And as he already stated and others have stated, Cashback for Communities has invested £74 million recovered from proceeds of crime. And uh, many of these things have ha happened throughout the country and in various other constituencies as well. I would like to talk about my own constituency, where in 2011, before the ca uh, during the campaign, I met with Glenifer Thistle Boys Club, and uh, they had actually received a small grant to enable them to ensure that they had a, f a football park of their own. They, they had difficulties, James Dornan has already mentioned, about trying to access football facilities, but they, they managed to build their own facility. They used a basket of funding measures and cash was one of them and the First Minister was there when the facility was opened in its entirety. But they've produced uh, footballers uh, that have played at a senior level in the past. Legends like St Mern's own Barry Levetti, Stephen Thompson, an at current Aberdeen manager and Paisley boy Derek McInnes whose only uh, unfortunate thing is he played for Morton at one point, but I'll leave that for uh, my colleague to mention that as well. But they've also had players like uh, Paul Gallagher, St. Martin, and, uh, played for St Martin, plays for Partick Thistle at the moment. But this continued investment in their football team in their area gives them an opportunity to not just invest in football and ensure that it gets young people involved in being healthy and having a healthy uh, lifestyle as well. Yes, I will. Just, just going back to my early contribution, and you know, these, these initiatives are, are really good. But why is Renfrewshire not getting it more than they are getting out of this? They currently get £274,000 per 10,000 young people. Angus gets 687 and Clackmannan gets 654 why is that unfairness in the system? Why well, is Renfrewshire not getting any more, and why are you not demanding Renfrewshire get more? Well, I'm George actually Adam. talking about the many the positives and the differences that it's making within the community, the fact that they've got access to this funding, and that facility wasn't available to that football club in the past. So I think we'll stick to the positive nature of this and make sure that we can talk about it, because only last week the Cabinet Secretary uh, announced the fact that one of six successful applicants was Castlehead High School in Paisley, in Renfrewshire, and they managed to. This is the funding they also got earlier on to create a SFA football school of excellence, an example of something in Renfrewshire and a great scheme as well. And the fact that we've managed to get many young people who have been bought involved in this and have been involved from referees to football and also healthy lifestyles as well. So these are all examples of this working. You know, hopefully these young men and women who are playing football in Castlehead High School can go on and follow in the footsteps of another well-known Paisley buddy, Archie Gemmell, and score a wonder goal in the World Cup. 
you know, because uh, these things are all going to help. But if I can suggest something for the future, uh, presiding officer, and possibly, or you could call it a pitch for uh, the Cabinet Secretary for something else as well. St Murn Street stuff is a campaign which I've mentioned on numerous occasions. It's been mentioned here by other members. They go out into the community. They work in the community. St Murn is a football club. They've been able to access in areas that other uh, local authorities and uh, other kind of uh, third sector groups just can't access because they have the credibility of being a football club. And the Cabinet Secretary is aware of a lot of the work that they have done in the community uh, presiding officer because he has visited St Murn recently. But they go out into street football. They get street football gym bus, the box, which is dancing and DJing. I'm getting a bit old for some of that myself. I'll maybe try football in the odd time. But uh, it's also about other programmes that they do. They've worked with uh, lots of community groups because St Murna are based in Fergusley Park in Paisley, one of the areas of multiple deprivations. And I would say that uh, they, they actually go out and they have helped young fathers who haven't been able to cook a meal, who haven't been able to do it. The kids go and play football and then they come back and dad is in the corporate hospitality area and he's made the meal for them as well. So all these things, if we could maybe take that idea, you've seen the dome, which St Murn have actually financed themselves. The Cabinet Secretary visited there recently and it shows how you can retrofit almost an indoor facility very cheaply as well. But I would say here's the, the pitch, presiding officer. Why don't we take that type of idea and talk about creating a football-based community hub where they have the credibility. I've mentioned before that the chairman of St Murn Football Club, uh, Stuart Gilmer, already said to the local authority, why don't you second some of your uh, social workers to me and I'll may make a difference in the community with that because it's about credibility and becoming part of the community and ensuring that you can use that community hub to make a difference in areas because I'm sick of hearing that areas like Ferguson Park and Paisley are regarded as an area of multiple deprivation and if we can use the local football club as an example. So the project would involve multiple sports, Kelburn Hockey Club, which incidentally has uh, uh, worked with uh, Duncan McInnes, who's the brother of uh, the Aberdeen manager as well, and he's involved in hockey. They're one of the best clubs in Scotland, and they've got to a stage where they want to be part of this of a water-based hockey pitch there. Why can't we use sport and use it as a way to not just talk about taking kids off the street to ensure that they do well for Friday nights and antisocial behaviour, but push them push them into a, an idea of access to education, to access to jobs, to access to something else. Now, I'm not asking that cash back for communities pay for all of this, but if anybody wanted to do that, that would be fine by me, but it would be a basket of measures, and it is. I'm just Percentage closing at the moment, minute. thanks. And uh, I think it's something that we should look at to take it to the next level to ensure. So I welcome this debate and all the fantastic work that's done throughout Scotland in our communities with cash back for communities. But I just think there is some way we can actually take it to the next level, presiding officer. Many thanks. Now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Maureen Watt. Uh, presiding officer, it's quite a difficult balancing act in this debate because I'm sure most of us could speak for six minutes and a lot more about initiatives in our own constituencies that have benefited from uh, cashback. But at the same time, I think there is an obligation on us to ask the question, is the money being spent in the best possible way? So I'll try and do both. Start with my constituency. Um, many uh, projects have benefited. I could mention, for example, the Spartans uh, Football Academy in the Grant and Pilton area of my constituency, which has certainly provided an enormous uh, service to a large number of young, uh, young uh, men and women uh, in my constituency. And like James Dornan and Patricia Ferguson, I particularly welcome the emphasis it has put uh, on girls' participation uh, in football. Indeed, it, a year or two ago, hosted the launch uh, of a national uh, initiative to uh, expand the involvement of girls and young women in football. And, you know, that was funded by cashback, so all credit to them. Uh, moving to the Leith end of my constituency, there's a project called Inspiring Leith, which is part of the link-up uh, projects that are uh, funded by cashback uh, across Scotland. And link-up is an asset-based uh, approach that starts by asking what's good about a community and what people, local people can contribute, rather than reinforcing the usual focus uh, on uh, deficits. So the projects bring local people together around a, a specific activity or area of interest. And on either side of Leith Walk, for example, the Bethany Christian Trust, the Friends of Lorne Primary School, uh, Pomeni Development 
development project and the Castle Kirk uh, Neighbourhood Association all uh, benefit from cashback funding for that particular initiative. And if I can mention, finally, in the middle of my constituency, Trinity Academy, where I was last night uh, speaking at the prize giving uh, and giving out the prizes, I, I noted uh, at the, uh, last night that they were a school of rugby uh, funded by um, uh, cash back from communities. And I was particularly uh, pleased to hear that they had recently trounced fetties at rugby. But having said that, and here I switch gear into the second part of my speech, I think it's still valid to ask as Graham Pearson asked, uh, is it right that Just Play receives £310,000 and Scottish Rugby £2.5 So I think we do have to ask that kind of question. And in that context, I found Table 3.1 in the evaluation report the most interesting uh, table of all, although, in fact, there were other interesting tables, as Duncan McNeill has reminded us. But in summary, sports received £27 million over the period, youth work £10 million, cultural activities £3 million, community assets £2 million, and early years not 0.449 million. So I do think we have to ask questions about that sector balance, and I'll come back to that at a moment. But the second thing I think we have to ask about is the area uh, balance. And here I, I agree with uh, colleagues uh, of mine who have said that the areas uh, most affected by crime should benefit, and they often are the areas uh, of most uh, disadvantage. So the original idea was the assets should go back to the communities uh, they come from through benefiting those communities and also acting to prevent crime in those areas. So I think there are some serious questions about the area balance, of, as others have highlight, highlighted. I think also there's an issue even within those areas about whether we need to target if we're serious about crime prevention. I, I looked at the um, Youth Link uh, Scotland evaluation of the Youth Work and Anti-Violence Fund and, and noticed among other comments that they made, fairly obvious when you think about it, that young people with the more demanding needs require the most intensive intervention. So even within the particular areas we want to target, are we targeting the individuals who actually uh, would most benefit from these activities. And that, of course, leads to the wider point that Graham Pearson and, again, Duncan McMeal have made. What is the evidence about who is being reached and what is effective? And I think all these questions have to be seriously uh, asked. And I think it's a bit disappointing, perhaps, in the evaluation that they haven't really been uh, dealt with in any um, uh, worthwhile kind of way. Now, going back just to the sector balance, I looked at the youth work allocations, for example, to uh, projects in my constituency for this year, and we're very grateful for any money, but Grant and Youth Centre received £2,500, Pomeni Development Project £2,500, Citadel Youth Centre £4,600. So yes, uh, thank you for the money, but it seems to me it's these projects in particular that are really critical and crucial in terms of reaching um, the people who, who, who we might want to reach. And I would rather those grassroots youth projects did receive a bit more of the money. And if that means, and it must mean, I think, logically less money to some of the sports activities, then I think that's a hard choice that we should make because politics, it's a bit of a cliche, is all about hard choices, but sometimes people aren't prepared uh, to make them. And uh, I would also make, just in passing, a comment about the early years, a uh, half a million pounds, the rhetoric of government and all we've been saying in many contexts for the last few years is, uh, you know, if we could have early intervention, we'd stop a lot of the crime. So I do wonder whether there should be a bit more in that direction as well. So drawing to a conclusion and, and the evaluation report, I hope recommendation 11 about a future evaluation will take on board the point about evidence that I have made. It is better, I think, in terms of outcomes uh, and indicators. Recommendation 4 is important project partners should focus on a relatively small number of key outcomes that they intend to deliver and project uh, recommendation seven that Duncan uh, McNeill referred to in terms of the inadequacies of the current situation said that the Scottish Government, my last word, should set out clearly the roles and responsibilities of the delivery partner and agree a clear proposal from any prospective del delivery partner about the way that they would deliver these roles and responsibilities and the indicators and measures by which the level will be monitored, reported and evaluated. So there are, there are useful recommendations in this report, but let's also have a bit more concentration on the evidence in the next evaluation report. Thanks so much. I now call on Maureen Watt to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm extremely pleased that we're having this debate on the back of the evaluation of the Cash Back for Community Scheme. 
I think this document is very helpful in taking forward the scheme because there are always things that can be done more efficiently and effectively. I just think this is an inspirational thing, and I think whoever thought up ring, ring fencing the asset seized from criminals and their criminal acts had a real light bulb moment. I realise that it builds on a previous scheme, but to see these communities benefit from money taken from criminals who perhaps lived in these communities and have terrorised people in these communities through gang-related activity, drug-related activity, racketeering or profiteering, um, these same communities and helping them is truly inspirational. And it's so welcomed by those who know about the scheme. I've been in company of, whether it be police, voluntary bodies, or those in delivering cashback schemes, who, when they hear a criminal has been caught, the conversation is not about how, as it might have been in the past, I wonder what length of sentence he or she will get, but how much money will be stripped from them through the Proceeds of Crime Act and come into the cashback scheme. So I welcome the latest announcement of where cashback money is going by the Cabinet Secretary in Aberdeen yesterday when he announced £1.5 million for 3G pitches at Aberdeen Sports Village and elsewhere because obviously playing in top-notch pitches is very important in our climate. In my years as an MSP, I have visited many football schemes funded by cashback at various venues throughout my constituency, whether it be in Torrey or Garthdee or the rest of Aberdeen. And I recognise that the F SFA has been very actively engaged in, di in delivering diverse programmes. And I think we ought to recognise that there may not be the... Um, you can't separate out youth schemes and uh, sports schemes because often they, they are the same thing because, of course, many of our youngsters uh, have a great love of football. I don't know how many individuals uh, are involved in the scheme, but all I know is that I very much doubt whether Scottish ba basketball would have been able to deliver twilight basketball coaching in the North East without cashback money. And in conjunction with sponsorship from private firms, uh, I've been at very uh, successful tournaments which they have, um, sponsor, which they have delivered, uh, along with uh, companies like Shell at their Woodbank Centre. And I was particularly struck by the number of Eastern European young women who were excellent basketball players, and as a result of these tournaments were progressing their skill by joining regional uh, teams and even uh, the national team. And I doubt whether this talent uh, would have been recognised if there hadn't been this cashback scheme. And it was clear that from the discussions that I had with coaches and others that some of these participants would have definitely taken a different, more negative path if that volleyball uh, coaching hadn't been available. So much focus is put on sporting activities, and of course not everyone will respond uh, to this. And that's why I'm pleased in the brochures that uh, other activities such as the arts, music and dance are also funded by cashback. I think the wider the variety of activity, the more disengaged youngsters can be stimulated towards positive activity and feel included in their communities. And I was also heartened to learn from the brochure that the Princess Trust and YouthLink access cashback to increase employability and help young people realise their potential. And on the last page, but by no means least, the Just Play joint venture between Angus Council and Police Scotland was highlighted. This scheme di works directly with families with a child from age no uh, 0 to 3 years where parents have a, a history of criminal activity. And the outcome has been that these children have more successfully started preschool or playgroup and the families together are using parks um, and local libraries. And, you know, I think, you know, the appendix two does state, uh, does uh, tell us about the partners, the stated outcomes and the progress against uh, these outcomes. And I think the more that can be done in that area, the better. Presiding officer, Aberdeen has accessed 1.5 million in the last five years and Aberdeenshire uh, about 1 million. And as I get out and about in my constituency in the evening into sports centres and community centres, 
I can see the benefit of cash back money. And finally, at one event I was at, I was asked to round up the activities which had brought primary schools in Aberdeen together to try out a variety of sporting activities. And in my speech, I pointed out that the event was funded by cashback and was surprised and heartened by the number of parents and teachers who were uh, unaware of pocket money and the cashback scheme, but were really impressed by it and thought it should be publicised even much more. So, of course, no one should be complacent about the scheme, but surely it is very much on the right tra trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Colin Stuart McMillan to be followed by John Pentland. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm delighted to speak in this debate this afternoon, and at the outset, I want to refer members to my register of interests, uh, as I will be highlighting uh, some of the work of the Ocean Youth Trust at Scotland. Uh, we've heard a lot this afternoon about uh, how cashback for communities has helped uh, our communities across Scotland, and we know how beneficial uh, it can be. And uh, the announcement by the Scottish Government uh, only yesterday, indicating funding. Uh, for more 3G pitches across the country, including in the west of Scotland and Paisley, uh, highlights uh, how this scheme can actually turn a negative situation uh, from crime into a positive. And uh, we can all agree that, uh, that obtaining uh, the assets from, uh, from ill-gotten gains are a positive thing. And unfortunately, it will be a continuing part of society going forward. Now, there will always be people who think that the law doesn't apply to them. And therefore, obtaining the ill-gotten gains and investing them wisely is something that, uh, that hopefully uh, that can actually be of some recompense to society. And I particularly uh, like investment uh, in our young people and providing them with the opportunities. And in looking at the, the evaluation report um, this week, it, uh, it was clear to me that, uh, that there has been an improvement in the scheme. That's uh, paragraph 26 of the report. And because of the processes that were introduced in 2011, and in, par in paragraph 27, it goes on to say that uh, the evaluation continues uh, by saying that uh, there is an increasingly strong focus on the outcomes. And furthermore, as a consequence of the evaluation, uh, project partners have increased their understanding that more needs to be done to engage some young people. And that's paragraph 28 of the report. Now, I, want to I want to take this opportunity certainly to highlight uh, the work of OITS, uh, of whom I am one of their ambassadors. And the slogan for Ocean Youth Trust for Scotland is Adventure Under Sail. And I've met a number of young people who have undertaken a voyage uh, by, by the OITS. And I've been delighted to actually hear their thoughts after that particular voyage that they've undertaken. Now, and one of the issues that struck me even more so was that of equalities and the equalities impact that sailing can actually provide. And the OITS provide voyages for young people from all communities in Scotland and for, for young people who either have disabilities uh, as well as those who don't have disabilities. And so of the £72,320 that OITS have received from Cashback for Communities, 177 young people have had an opportunity to do something different. They've been given an opportunity to get involved in a scheme that really takes people out of their comfort zone uh, and uh, actually helps them to build up their self-confidence and their self-esteem. And these 177 young people it came from a variety of locations across the country. Inverclyde, Renfrewshire, East Renfrewshire, East Ayrshire, South Lanarkshire, Eastern Bartonshire, Falkirk, and also Aberdeen. And many of those who have taken part have been referred by another body, whether it's uh, from uh, a youth project or engaged Renfrewshire or community learning and development departments of local authorities. And, uh, but certainly the two quotes that I, th that I certainly have found to be uh, probably the most useful uh, to actually define how beneficial cashback for communities has been are these. And the first one is from Emma Noble. And she's the, the group leader from the, the Princess Trust. And Emma, she goes on to say that the, the experience certainly uh, had an impact on them. I was able to see personal development outcomes over five days that would have taken five weeks in a classroom environment. And it goes on to say that the group are just back from work placements. Uh, they've uh, been a massive success and a lot of that stems from their OIT trip. They apply the skills uh, they've learned with OIT, and some have now been given job placements. One lad has since uh, been on OIT's Boston training uh, to become a volunteer. He was the quiet wee mouse of the group uh, and the biggest turnaround. And the second quote is that from Thomas James, uh, who is a project development worker for Positive Alternatives. Uh, and he says that, I learned that young people can achieve amazing things if given a chance. Please continue to support OITS 
as the trips they provide are an amazing opportunity for, uh, that the young people I work with would never be able to pursue or achieve. Uh, that, these two quotes certainly highlight to me that the, the, the positive, certainly not just the OYTS, but if it wasn't for the cash back for communities' monies that actually went in to actually take the, these... Uh, sure, OK. Duncan McNeill. A, a very good example, and um, your involvement in that group, uh, uh, of course, is recognised as a very good example of, uh, of dealing with young people with particular problems. But do you not, do you not um, uh, agree that so much more could be done to target that, those individuals? And do you not despair, like I do, that the West of Scotland, your constituency, is, suffers in, uh, a, a poor comparison with Shetland, Orkney, Angus and Clackmannan in terms of share of the, ca the Cash Back for Communities Fund? Well, certainly, thanks so much uh, for the, the intervention. Uh, I mean, certainly with the comments that uh, the question you put to my colleague, um, George Adam earlier on, I, was, I actually thought that uh, you were arguing for Inverclyde to actually have less money uh, with the example that you put earlier on. No, no, ex exactly. No, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, but certainly that, that was the impression I got from earlier on. No, it's uh, exactly Western Scotland. This is my constituency. Uh, but I mean, uh, one of the things that I, that I certainly appreciate is the fact that the Cash Back for Communities funding it goes in and it does help people from across the country. I mean, irrespective of what we think, we do live in a country. We do live in Scotland. And, and I think it's incumbent upon all MSPs to try to make sure that everyone in Scotland actually has a best, the best opportunity in life. Certainly, presiding officer, uh, so one of the things that, uh, that I... Uh, one of the things, I'm conscious of time now. One of the things that, uh, that I'm very uh, keen on uh, is actually just listening to, the, listening to the young people and the examples of how uh, an opportunity through Cash Back for Communities has actually helped them and actually helped them change their lives. And one, very briefly, was a young lady Whose, whose life was really 200 metres diameter. That was it. As a consequence of cash back for communities, she, began, she broadened her horizons, she improved her self-esteem and her self-confidence, and she also began to respect herself and others. Now, for me, that tells me a story that cash back for communities, irrespective of where somebody's from, is very much a good thing and should be continued. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now, Colin John Pelton to be followed by Colin Keir. Thank you, President Officer. Cashback for the communities has the potential to help our most deprived areas, which are often also areas blighted by crime. In Motherwell and Wishaw, as elsewhere in Scotland, cashback funds sports including basketball and rugby. And at Braithurst High School, for example, there is a school of football involving Motherwell FC and the club's community trust. There are also youth and arts programmes such as SPL Music, which also involved Motherwell FC. The new Opportunities Project in North Motherwell is a good example of how cashback can bring benefits to communities. Set up by North Motherwell Parish Church Minister Derek Pope and his wife and project worker Helm, it also involves St Bernadette's Church and is funded through Inspiring Scotland's Link Up programme. Now, this project draws on the strengths within the community and builds on the many skills and talent local people have to offer. They, have, they now have around 50 regular volunteers running a community cafe, a running club, a youth club, and a groups for arts and crafts, women, and parents and toddlers. And they engage with about 200 people per week and can evidence benefits through developing networks and friendships, tackling isolation, building confidence and self-esteem contributing to health and well-being, and, and volunteers acquiring skills to help them to gain employment. The project is inclusive, and last month held an international women's evening involving 80 women from six different nationalities. Now, that's the good news, but just think how much better it could be if we tackled the very poor asset recovery. For the UK, Figures show just one quarter of 1% of criminal proceeds are confiscated and only 2% of confiscation orders are paid in full. And as Green Pearson has rightly said, the Scottish Government is unable to say whether Scottish figures are better or worse. And, but if we knew the figures, we might be able to see if we are making progress. Now, work needs to be done in such matters. But, you know, I have a concern that this will be part like other important issues until after a referendum. So maybe perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could tell us in the summing up 
when this work will start. There are also questions about the distribution of money that is recovered. You know, are funds distributed based on who shouts the most loudly, or even who knows how to ask, rather than on the basis of need? Now, taking child poverty as a measure of need, North Lancashire is not the worst. At 21%, it's eighth among, among local authorities, just behind others that have been highlighted. However, there is a significant variation, and the council area includes significant areas of very high deprivation. Now, despite this, per capita expenditure from cashback has just been 85% of the Scottish average. And despite being in the top quarter of local authorities based on need, North Lanarkshire is 22nd, just outside the bottom quarter in terms of expenditure per young person. That actually works out at just a fiver a year per young person. And looking at activities and opportunities there, that are funded, we only have 3.9% of the total. Or to put it another way, in the course of six years, there has been less than one opportunity per young person. Only one area had fewer activities compared to the population they serve. The North Lancashire is an example of how the system is not targeting the funds the way I believe it should be. The amount recovered may be a lot less than we hope, but even then, is what we do recover getting through to the intended users. We have heard that it is getting diverted to areas that should receive direct funding, replacing funds that were previously met by the Scottish Government. In, partic in particular, is the Scottish Government planning to use proceeds of crime to fund policing in this way? And are the pre proceeds of crime already being used to plug the gap left by government cuts? Again, the Cabinet Secretary may want to answer these questions in the summing up. I note from the funding enhanced recovery was mentioned in a response to a parliamentary question which confirmed that the Scottish Government had advised that they were content to proceed with a budget that included receipt of pocket monies. Are the police recovering money to pay for the police who are recovering the money? We, we need far more transparency on police budgets here and indeed across the board. President Officer, cash back for communities was set up to assist projects in the communities across Scotland, particularly those affected by deprivation. Let's make sure it does what it says in the box and that the cash gets to those communities. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Colin Keir, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there's something deeply satisfying about uh, cash coming from the criminal fraternity and heading back into uh, society. I think we're all, we've all been speaking about this subject. Many have mentioned it. I think it, we do have to sort of look at the fact that it is doing a lot of good. And despite some of the differences in evaluation and perhaps some of the things that have been taken on, I think this has been a particularly useful uh, debate, and I was very interested indeed with Malcolm Chisholm's uh, contribution, uh, given he's in the neighbouring constituency uh, to mine, and uh, some of the cashback money has been focused in that area of Edinburgh, which perhaps has seen better times and will most certainly have a better future. And some of the uh, initiatives that have happened uh, down in that area should be commended. I'm delighted to have been called to this uh, debate because it does give me the example, uh, the chance, sorry, to actually talk about at least a couple of projects uh, within my area. I know we've gone through the figures and the likes, and I wouldn't like to uh, bring all, you know, basically regurgitate what's been said, but I'd like to give you an idea. One of the areas very close to Malcolm Chisholm's area, indeed the uh, council ward uh, covers both uh, uh, parts of the, our constituencies is the one in Muirhouse uh, Fourth Ward, which is uh, uh, which, where the neighbourhood uh, has the North Edinburgh Arts Centre run by Kate Wimpress, and she was gushing about the uh, what's been done through cashback for communities uh, to me the other day. There, uh, the NEA uh, demo fund is it uh, uh, was managed. Uh, 
awarded £7,870 to a project that allowed five unpublished solo artists and bands up to 25 years old to record professionally mastered demo tracks and create links with the industry experts, increasing access to further education opportunities. And I think when we remember these things that it's not just the community as such, it's actually individuals. And one of them, uh, Callum Cummins, a production volunteer and artist, said, the demo fund gave me the kind of specialist support which I encouraged my development both as a youth worker, musician and artist and gave me valuable experience which will help, uh, hopefully help me move towards my goal of taking on a professional role in the creative industries. And the other project was one which gained £25,000, just over Muirhouse Youth and Development Group Roughing It project. And the project engaged local young people from the Fourth Ward area, which I share with Malcolm Chisholm. And it's an area which has had lower arts engagements. And, uh, and this was found through a taking part survey. And it encourages greater arts participation to inspire their lives and that of their extended community. Through filmmaking, the project provided a range of opportunities for young people to input creatively. A short film was created, titled Roughing It, which was screened to over 200 people at the North Edinburgh Arts Centre and the Edinburgh Film House in October of 2013. Now, this project aimed to support the health and well-being of young people involved through participation in the filmmaking. It provided a platform to air the reflections of life, contributing to their overall well-being and self, or sense of self. It filled a gap in provision by creating opportunities for intergeneration work between older and younger community members. And through the work, this uh, carried on through the local ethnic minority young people, encouraging greater community cohesion. It's a fine piece of work. And perhaps the most exciting part of these two examples that I've given thanks to Cashback to our communities, is a sense of achievement which comes from the confidence to try. And it's, it's this personal development, really, which is the key, I believe, to Cashback for Communities. I believe it really does work. It's one of these things that really should be highlighted. Many people today have talked about the basketball. Now, it's not a sport that I know terribly well, but it turns out the local community sports hub in my area, which the Cabinet Secretary has uh, visited on a few occasions, I believe, at uh, Forrester and St Augustine's, is one of the centres. And I spoke to Chris Dodds, a senior officer at uh, uh, Basketball Scotland, who, of course, are actually cited in my constituency at the Gael, and he was gushing forth about the idea of what cashback does for sports and through the local community. And one of the things, actually, which was fantastic for me to hear was actually one of the problems that came up in the health and sports debate some time ago about girls under 16 and the participation. Turns out through cashback they're able to do programmes which actually encourage girls under 16. They've got a record amount of people, young girls particularly, who are taking up the sport. And given, uh, say, the debate that we had a few months ago, I think that is absolutely fantastic. It is a real success story. And when you take through the other items that come through with basketball, with getting the team spirit, the community spirit, bringing kids in from perhaps areas which are, uh, are you know, have seen better days, I think this, this is a project to, to use. I think it was Maureen Watt who used it. Whoever thought this up had a light bulb moment. And it really has been absolutely fantastic. So I see my time's running a little bit short, uh, uh, presiding officer, so I would just commend the motion from the Cabinet Secretary, and whatever we think about the evaluation, this is something that works and it's effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we move to closing speech, I just remind all members they should be in the chamber for the closing speeches, and I now call on Annabel Goldie up to seven minutes. Please. Uh, Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The process of Crime Act 2002 was an exciting innovation in our justice system, a very good UK act, as Christine Graham so appositely pointed out. I think for a justice system to work, there need to be three components. Firstly, the law and court sentences should reflect the public need for justice to be seen to be done. Secondly, the mechanisms of law enforcement and prosecution must be efficient and effective. 
And lastly, and perhaps most importantly of all, there must be a public confidence in how the whole system works. Now, the first two components will be materially important in creating that confidence, but I think the proceeds of Crime Act brings an added dimension. What that does is provide tangible evidence to the public that reporting crime, helping the police to solve crimes, and assisting in the prosecution of crime can result in real community benefit. Back in 2002, I don't suppose anyone was quite clear what the practical consequences of the Act would be. And the results, both under the previous Scottish Executive and under the current administration, have been positive. As others have pointed out, £74 million have been recovered since 2007 from criminals and invested in uh, various activities. And the breadth of activity represented by the uh, partnership organisations, sport, youth work, cultural activities, mentoring and youth employability, early years and community assets, all enabling <coughs> projects and facilities to be delivered across all of Scotland's 32 local authorities, demonstrates both the diversity and the geographical reach of such benefits. Many communities have seen at first hand the positive effect of recovering money from criminals and distributing it to communities. So from the public perspective, ill-gotten gains are being recycled into positive community benefit. And that is good. And I think there's nothing to separate me from the Cabinet Secretary in, in how this is being addressed. But I think there is still a rich vein to be mined. My colleague Margaret Mitchell in her amendment is absolutely right to call for more analysis of crimes which may hold the potential for increasing the recovery of proceeds from criminals. And I don't think anyone could object to that. Indeed, Mr Adams, it might even benefit street stuff and you and I would cheer if that were the case. Of course, the price of success is that more people become interested in getting their mitts on the cash. And I think it is important to sort out some of the myths. I have mentioned how important to a workable criminal justice system are efficient and effective mechanisms of law enforcement and prosecution. These, in fact, are essential public services. And it is therefore a primary responsibility of government to ensure they are both provided and adequately funded. So it is with some unease, and others have echoed this, that I have noted over the past five years some of the recovered proceeds of crime being channeled to the Crown Office and over the last four years to the police. Indeed, very recently, Police Scotland has voiced an enthusiasm for getting its mitts on more of the booty. Now, although the amounts are small, and I accept that, there is, Deputy Presiding Officer, an important principle here. Proceeds of crime were never intended to be a substitute for any part of the core funding of essential public services. That is a Scottish Government responsibility. But quite distinct from that is whether in certain circumstances Police Scotland and the Crown Office should be able to benefit from the recovery of money from criminals if they can identify a project or an initiative quite separate from their routine activities which are already covered by their budgets. Now that is a different proposition. It would be on a bid-by-bid -bid basis, the case would require to be made, and there would have to be a transparent link to a specific benefit for the wider community. That is, I think, a reasonable proposition, hence reference to it in the Conservative Amendment. And may I, Deputy Presiding Officer, appeal to the flinty heart of the Cabinet Secretary. We are actually trying to help, not to hinder. We are trying to introduce a degree of flexibility, which I think is not uh, hugely at variance with his own, his own assessment. What is unacceptable is that Police Scotland or the Crown Office should be put on a footing of automatic payments from uh, the proceeds of crime that are recovered. Because that would equate Police Scotland being paid a commission on crime, which I think is undesirable. And in that situation, there would be a clear danger of diluting attention on all crime and focusing only on financial high-yield crimes. Now, let me say that if the Cabinet Secretary is rejecting the Conservative Amendment, I am a little apprehensive as to where he is going. What is his direction of travel? It seems to me that that amendment actually reflects what I think he may have in mind, but stops short of doing something which I think everybody would regard as, frankly, unhealthy, undesirable, and not a good destination. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, the Cabinet Secretary may, in his uh, wind-up remarks, want to take the opportunity to just reflect a little on the tone of uh, Margaret Mitchell's amendment. As I say, it is not meant to be provocative. It is not meant to be hostile. It is actually meant to try and introduce that, I think, important element of flexibility. And I'm not unsympathetic to what I think Police Scotland are anxious to try and achieve. I'm just very, very uh, cautious about going down a, a route of uh, travel which may open the gates to something very undesirable and I don't think any of us would want to see. Because at the end of the day, Deputy Presiding Officer, the police are there to serve us all. And they are there to enforce the law where any crime has been committed. And we would not want a police force in Scotland which was only interested in bonus, commission, dividend yield on targeting only high value of crime. And I think we must be very careful that whatever is proposed by the Cabinet Secretary, that is not where we end up. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I say I have found this a constructive debate? I have found it an interesting debate. I actually don't think there's a world of difference uh, in the Chamber um, about where we want to try and go. I appreciate my colleagues in the Labour benches are very very hostile to any possibility of any recovered proceeds going anywhere but to communities. All I'm saying is, if the money wouldn't be there in the first place, but for the successful operation of the Police and Prosecution Service, don't they deserve a little opportunity to get a wee bit of the cake? As you don't draw think that's too unreasonable. Please. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I urge the Chamber to support Margaret Mitchell's amendment. Many thanks. I now call on Dr Elaine Murray. Up to nine minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, Christine Gray made a, a comment about a turf war, and I think, I, I think I'll start by saying that there was no intention to suggest that there was a turf war. It's just a, about a progression, indeed, uh, from uh, Proceeds of Crime Act through in March 2006, when Cathy Jimson announced £2 million of criminal gains to be reinvested into areas of Scotland hardest hit by crime, uh, and those were specifically targeted at local authority wards in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Inverclyde, North Ayrshire, Renfrewshire and West Dunbartonshire. Uh, to try and show that uh, young people in those areas that crime didn't pay. And we are actually pleased that the SNP government in 2007 decided to take on that initiative and to build on it and expand on it. The questions here now, seven years on, are can it be used um, even more effectively that, than it is? And can actually more proceeds be seized? Because as John Pentline po pointed out, across the UK, only 0.25% of uh, proceeds are recovered from criminals and only about 2% are paid in full. So there's a lot more that we could probably get our mitts on, as Annabel Goldie put it. Uh, I, the other issue, and I think others referred to this in the debate, was that actually serious organised crime, crime has been estimated to cost the Scottish economy about £2 billion per annum uh, last year, but we only managed to seize £8 million of that. So I think there's a general agreement that we could do more on that. A number of colleagues have raised concerns about uh, information and the lack of it. Uh, on the correlation between communities where the highest percentages of children and young people are living in poverty. And I think that was the point that Patricia Ferguson was making. In Glasgow, where one in three children live in poverty, Glasgow is only receiving per 10,000 head of population of young people and slightly more than the Scottish average. Now, surely an area where there's significant deprivation should be getting more other than areas where there are actually a smaller percentage of children uh, who live in poverty. If, Yes, sure. Mr. Crawford, a number of occasions during the contributions, and I understand where people are coming from that, but I think that I was then trying to work out why some of that might be, and it might not suggest at all, but if you're trying to build a project, say, in the Western Isles, and you're giving £50,000 to the Western Isles to make something happen um, in that area, then obviously that £50,000 per head will not equate to the same... Um, amount per head of, of, of young person as it would in Glasgow, mm -hmm. but it might actually take that 50,000 quid to make a facility happen in somewhere like the Western Isles. So there may be, underneath some of this, some actual rationale explanation, not at all, but there'll be something in there about that. Dr. Well, I accept as somebody who represents a rural area that costs in rural areas are higher, but this is actually over five years, and considering the significant levels of deprivation in parts of Scotland, it doesn't look as if those parts of Scotland are necessarily getting the, the share of the monies that they do, that they need to actually combat crime. Um, I think there was a lot of important uh, points made by members. Duncan McNeill uh, asked about 
how cashback could work better and what outcomes do we expect to see. Bruce Crawford indeed asked, I think, made a very important point about the evaluation of the economic benefit and indeed on youth employment, because actually what is more important for diverting young people from uh, crime than actually being in a job? And Malcolm Chisholm questioned the allocation between different sorts of activities and whether enough is being put into early use uh, and the allocation to disadvantaged communities. I don't think we can just assume that because if somebody's taking part in sport, they're not taking part in crime, that if that person was ta wasn't taking in part, part in sport, they would be taking uh, part in crime. It's not, uh, not logical to turn it on its head. And we do need to know whether we're actually hitting those people who, might, who need to be diverted for crime rather than providing opportunities for other young people who would never commit a crime anyway. But well, there are a lot of good projects. My own local constituency, uh, a cashback for, uh, supports a whole range of community sporting uh, and cultural activities. It supports, for example, as others as in other areas, Bank of Scotland uh, Midnight League, uh, along with the Scottish Football Associations and others. And earlier this year, I visited the Midnight League at the Hillview Leisure Centre in Callahome, where despite it being an absolutely horrendous, uh, a wet and miserable night with horizontal rain, about t 20 young uh, men, as it happened to be in this uh, case, were engaged in playing football. Uh, Callahome is an ex-mining community and one of the 15% most deprived uh, communities as measured by the Scottish in in Index of Multiple Deprivation. So, yes, good to see money going in there to support uh, communities. And indeed, uh, Dumfries and Galloway has... Um, many reasons to be grateful to cashback. We used to be the only region in Scotland not to have a 3G pitch, thanks to contributions from cashback and Sports Scotland and others. It uh, then, in 2012-13, had three uh, pitches, one in Annan, one in Dumfries and one in Stranraer, and we've now got another one uh, at Queen of the South, so we have a lot to be grateful to cashback for. I want, though, to talk a little bit about what was worried a number of us, like Alison McInnes, John Pendle and, uh, and uh, Annabel Goldie, in her summing up speech. Uh, which was the £6 million which has uh, appeared in the Police Scotland's revenue budget uh, and which looks as if it could be substituting for things that Police Scotland already did. Because the revenue budget proposal presented to the SBA board at its meeting in Inverness in March stated in paragraph 2.9, in addition to grant and aid funding of £1.016 million, further funding of £6 million has been anticipated in 2014-15, representing the expected resources from the proceeds of Crime Act, which the Scottish Government will allocate to the authority. This funding is to be applied to support Police Scotland's payments to third parties in our communities. Now, this seemed to be new because I couldn't see it in the budget document. The, the format was different. I couldn't see it in the budget do uh, 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 document uh, approved in the previous year. And further to that, Assistant Chief Constable Ruri Nicholson was pretty sure that this funding was needed to supplement Police Scotland's budget. Because he told Holyrood Ma Magazine in March that what Police Scotland wanted was that the government, quote, fund these projects that Police Scotland is no longer able to fund community projects through the, pro through the proceeds of crime. And he went on to say... There's no question that community projects are under threat. Some will have to stop. It could be anything all the way from CCTV to partnership working to some of the third sector work that is supported by the police service. Now, a subsequent paper to the SPA board meeting in Airdrie in April, which is for noting, uh, not just for approval, provided detail on how the proceeds of crime money is to be used and allocated within Police Scotland. And this paper also stated that the government had written to the board, SPA, confirming that, quote, estimates of anticipated receipts from the proceeds of crime can be contained within budget proposals for 2014-15 and 2015-16. And this was to be applied to support Police Scotland's payments to third parties and in our communities, and that a bidding process would be required. The paper goes on to give examples of organisations and community organisations which have previously been supported by Police Scotland, such as the National Crime Agency, CCTV, Crime Stoppers, a Community Fund, the Youth Volunteers uh, Scheme and Viper. Now, what I want to know is, is £6 million from cashback now substituting this year for funding previously supplied by Police Scotland's budget? Because if it does, it represents part of Police Scotland's savings package. And what I haven't been able to find out is what the estimate for receipts from POCA to Police Scotland is in the next year. But there have been reports in the media that a total of £16 million will be transferred over the two years. Now, if you bear in mind that the total sums received from the proceeds of crime in Scotland were £12 million in 2013-14 uh, and £8 million in 2013-14, 
unless there's going to be a lot more seizures uh, this year, it would appear that 75% of some seized last year has been agreed by the Scottish Government to direct, go directly to the coffers of Police Scotland. So I'm confused now. Does the two, £24 million over three years for cashback announced by the Cabinet Secretary include this funding? Is this funding within the Police Scotland uh, budget now being considered to be part of the cashback scheme? And again, given the content of the two papers which went to the SPA board in March and April, I was very puzzled by the answer given by the Cabinet Secretary to my colleague Graham Pearson in May, uh, in which he stated the Scottish Government has not currently allocated any money seized under the proceeds of crime legislation to support the budget of Police Scotland or the Scottish Police Authority in 2014-15 or 15-16. Uh, and he said that the task force agreed that should additional proceeds of crime funding become available, it will advise Scottish ministers of the options of how to allocate the money. But it, that was actually answered after the Scottish Government apparently had written to the SBA confirming that the receipts could be added to the revenue budget. So really, some clarification is required. And I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary could put that on the record so that we know what's going on, because it seems to be very unclear. Cashback is a success. We all agree that cash back is a success, but what I need to know is £6 million being taken out of cash back and given to the police to do things that they already did using their own revenue budget. Thanks very much. I now call on Kenny McCaskill to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government uh, Cabinet Secretary. You have until 4.54, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me deal with some of the remarks that have come there, not simply in the uh, wind-up speeches, but throughout the speech. I think there's been a general welcoming for cashback, and I'm grateful for that. It does appear to me appropriate that we should build around a scheme that we are proud of as a government, but we do accept had started uh, by the previous executive, but was changed and refined by us. And equally, it does build upon the 2002 Act, and uh, not only will I, does Annabel Goldie agree with Christine Graham, but I agree with both of them. We very much welcome that and we support this action. Uh, no administration in any jurisdiction would uh, not oppose it and equally I think it's fair to say I welcome the comments that have been made by members across the chamber about the good things that have been done uh, by Cashbank, the good things that they've seen and spoken to in sporting activities, especially amongst aspects such as I think raised by James Dorn and indeed by Patricia Ferguson about dealing with girls' participation in sports, and we are grateful that the uh, organisations involved in that have targeted that, because, as was mentioned by other speakers, we've had debates here about the issues and difficulties have been there. I think it's also clear, and I think, again, Patricia Ferguson made a fair point about seeking to broaden it simply from sports. I think it would be fair to say that when we first started the scheme, the initial bangs for bucks was to deal with what do we do with young people hanging around street corners on a Friday or Saturday night. And the immediate easy hit is to look at street football and other such activities that are easily pulled together. But I think it's a fair point, and we accept that, uh, that whilst we very much welcome the input by the Scottish Football Association, but equally uh, by other organisations, be it rugby, basketball, boxing, or the other sporting organisations, that it isn't simply uh, by sport alone. And that's why members mentioned music, I think John Pentland mentioned the music project at uh, Motherwell, that I think I visited myself. It does have to include drama, music, arts, dance. There is something there for every young person. What we've got to try and do is to ensure sure that we offer that opportunity. Equally, I think it would be fair to say that cashback might also be a victim of its own success. We would love to fund everything, but we can't. We are constrained by the limits on what money we have, and there will be organisations that have made representations to me who are disappointed, and I am disappointed that I have to disappoint them. But we have to go with the funds that are currently with us, but we do seek to broaden them out and spread them across. Equally, as George Adams and others have made, and indeed it came again across from the Chamber, there are other ideas, and we're happy to take them on board to see what we can do, because more funding will come in, and we do always seek to have projects that we can pull down, so, so to speak, from the shelf if we do get a windfall project, and that was done previously, money from the Weir Group or money from the Abbott Group, and it's a commitment that we make to many organisations at the present. If we cannot fund them and we think that they are worthwhile, then what we do is seek to have them uh, there on the shelf. If a windfall comes in, then we can seek to uh, uh, deliver it. 
I think there's been two specific parts of the debate that I need to uh, comment on. Uh, first, about the cashback funding formula, where the money goes, perhaps raised initially by uh, Duncan McNeill, but also proceeds of crime aspect, and I'll be happy to refer to both Margaret Mitchell and, as I say, uh, Annabel Goldie. In terms of the funding, let me be quite clear. It's stated there in the table that Duncan McNeill was referring to it at uh, uh, 3.11. The number one area fund funded, as James Dornan pointed out, is the City of Glasgow with over 5 million. Then it's the City of Edinburgh with just under 4 million. Then it's North Lanarkshire with just over 2 million. And then we're down to Dundee with almost 1 and 3 quarter million, followed by other areas. Uh, Duncan McNeill was referring to the percentage, I think, of 10,000 population and where money goes. I would refer him to paragraph 3.14. The figures show that relative expenditure has been higher in the island authorities and that a number of predominantly rural authorities have also received above average expenditure based on the population of young people. There are some rural areas, by all means. Neil. The reading of, the, of the, the, the evaluation to say that, you've just read out what the evaluation said, but the question that Bruce Crawford raised was sharing my puzzlement about why it should be so high. And there is no explanation in this evaluation about why it should be higher in these areas. What we, what we have said and made quite clear, there are some rural areas uh, that do have a relatively high uh, young population. Equally, there are other rural areas, in particular the islands, where there is a significant cost that goes with running an event. And I think it was Bruce Crawford that alluded to that. It was, in fact, when I visited areas such as the Western Isles that they made representations that, for example, to run a football event in Greenock or indeed in eastern Edinburgh, is an awful lot cheaper than running one in the Western Isles, where by the very nature of the peripherality and the rurality you require to bus kids in. I have no doubt that will be exactly the same in some areas that uh, uh, Elaine Murray uh, represents. So we have to accept and recognise, and not at the moment, let me, uh, uh, let me make this point, we have to accept and recognise that there is a rurality cost, there is a peripherality cost, and that's why we recognise it, not simply with the island communities that we have in Scotland, but indeed rural communities both in the north, south and other areas of Scotland, they should not be prejudiced because they do not have the funding wherewithal to provide what can be done at a significantly cheaper cost in an urban area, whether it's eastern Edinburgh or Greenock. Patricia Ferguson. Patricia Ferguson. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention and I can absolutely accept that there will be issues of rurality that have to come into play. But where in the, that document does it show you where the issues of deprivation come into play? Because surely it's harder with more young people in a more deprived area than it is in an area without those issues. Cabinet Secretary. From the areas and the money that we put in, that uh, we take that into account. Uh, what we're quite clear and what we're not prepared to do is to end up with any means testing where a youngster is told that they cannot participate because they are not viewed as deprived enough or having to have people apply. So we factor in and make sure that those areas with multiple deprivation, blighted by crime, get that additional uh, benefit. Equally, I take issue and disagree vehemently uh, with Duncan McNeill that somehow or other we are spreading the jam thin. I think every child in Scotland, whether they live in an island in Shetland, whether they live in an urban area in central Scotland, is entitled to participate in these things. And we will not impose a postcode lottery that youngsters, as I say, will be precluded, will be precluded. So that, as I say, I think deals with that aspect. Let me deal with the second aspect and say that we're happy to engage. And as I said, I said that prior to uh, 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 the meeting with, uh, uh, with Margaret Mitchell. I'm happy to try and engage and sure, because I think we can actually work together. Yes, we have been taking money seized from the proceeds of crime and money has been put back in. That is, as uh, Bruce Crawford mentioned, it's about speculating to accumulate. The money that went in has gone in, for example, into forensic accountants, because I think uh, both Margaret Mitchell and Annabel Goldie. A lot of this is about dealing with the money trail. I think Margaret Mitchell makes a good point about those who are involved in uh, repeated high-level thefts and shoplifting, but equal. A lot of this is about serious organised crime, as I think it was uh, Elaine Murray, it may have been, you know, Patricia Ferguson, rather, who was reading about an advert where people can afford to have the best accountants and the best lawyers to try and hide the assets that they have taken to launder money that they have made through drugs or anything. So we make sure that we employ forensic accountants. Many of them are not police officers. Many of them are civilian staff, and they do a remarkably good job. So, as I say, that's where we come from in that. 
As was mentioned, I think, by Annabel Goldie, there is a hierarchy in terms of where we come from. The Crown are quite clear that initially they will look to prosecute. That is the right thing to do. We are not prepared to consider going, as some other jurisdictions, not too far from here, where uh, quite often it can appear uh, that perhaps people can make a deal and pay almost a tax or levy. So the principal matter here, if there is a fending and criminality, number one, it will be sought to be prosecuted. Equally, if we can recover from them, we will also seek to do so. If there are instances where, because the standard of proof, we cannot get proof beyond reasonable doubt in a criminal matter, but it's quite clear by their lifestyle, then we can take it, then we will pursue thereafter. Equally, in terms of the Serious Organised Crime Task Force, by all means... Cabinet Secretary, a very um, brief we'll... intervention. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary reassure the Chamber that the Scottish Government is not proceeding to a situation where Police Scotland can expect an automatic annual dividend from the proceeds of crime? Cabinet Secretary. I can give the member that uh, assurance. I think there's good reason for that. Not only would it be the wrong thing to do, I think it's also the case that it actually could be subject to challenge under ECHR and there are some, uh, I think, suggestions that there may be issues south of the border and we've never gone there. So I can give her that assurance and as was mentioned, the priority here is first of all, to fund the cashback scheme. Uh, second, as agreed by the task force, whether it's for forensic accountants, whether it's for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Office, whether it's for police, it may even be for the Scottish Prison Service or indeed for other organisations, because round the, round the serious organised crime task force, organisations as diverse as CIFA, uh, SOLAS and indeed others say representing local authorities. So we're looking to do and take uh, what can be best done. So if we can speculate to accumulate with any organisation we will do so, but the decision will be made by the task force. If above that there are money still available, then we're happy to look at community projects. But rather than denigrate the Chief Constable, can I be quite clear, I think the uh, proceeds of crime have benefited from Chief Constable House. He is the one that has put it to me that there has been a change in how the police have dealt with. There was time, perhaps, when officers would have gone in and perhaps arrested and detained the drug dealer and taken the bag of white powder as evidence. Now it's quite police officers, not simply those who are going in, but those who are investigating, those who are community bobbies, are also looking at assets. If, as well as detaining the accused, they have a lifestyle, they have the Rolex, they have the plasma screen, they have the BMW, and all of these things that hard-working, law-abiding people paying their taxes don't have, then let's look about seizing them. It's about making sure that through Crime Stoppers, that people who are living well beyond their means, who are preying off our communities, are reported and indeed dealt with, by all means. Yeah. Very, very briefly... I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. Does he understand, however, given the uh, concerns that have been expressed about the funding source from proceeds of crime, that you actually challenge the integrity of, of why officers and prosecutors operate, given an interest in generating income rather than the pursuit of justice? And whether that perception is accurate or otherwise, we need to be alive to it. It's a strange well, interpretation of brief, Cabinet well, Secretary. I've, brief, I've been very brief. I gave up. the assurance to Annabel Goldie, and I reiterate that I think what the Chief Constable is quite right is to make sure that everybody realises that serious organised crime is our business. It's entirely unacceptable, and I simply move the motion in my name, saying that cash back has been a remarkably good scheme, and it will continue to serve the young people of Scotland remarkably well. Thank you. That concludes the debate on cash back for communities. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10284 in the name of Richard Lockhead on a public bodies consent motion, public bodies abolition of food from Britain order 2014 UK legislation. And I call on Richard Lockhead to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary. Formally moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of two motions. In the name of Stuart Stevenson, on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. The first is motion number 10243 on hybrid bills. I call on Stuart Stevenson to speak to and move the motion. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am, of course, proud to have been the Minister who introduced the Fourth Crossing Bill, the first and only hybrid bill considered by this Parliament. The rules for considering hybrid bills were added to standing orders to facilitate consideration of the bill and were an amalgamation of the rules for public and private bills. The fourth crossing bill was successfully passed and work has now commenced on the fourth replacement crossing to be named the Queensferry Crossing. 
When it had completed its work on the bill, the Fourth Crossing Bill Committee helpfully produced a report which suggested improvements to the hybrid bills process. This has resulted in the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee recommending a number of relatively minor changes to these rules and to the corresponding rules for private bills, including clarifying the role of the assessor and streamlining the production of accompanying documents. I commend these changes to members as the committee believes they will improve the process for consideration of both hybrid and private bills. And I move motion S4M 10243 in my name. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. No members asked to speak in this very, very short debate. So the question this motion will be put at decision time. The second is motion number 10244 on EU legislative proposals, review of standing orders. Mr. Stevenson, I would be obliged if you would continue until five o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. In uh, 2010, the Parliament agreed a new European strategy for its committees. This followed uh, major changes introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon, which gave the Scottish Parliament, through the UK Government, a role in raising subsidiarity concerns. The strategy was supported by standing order changes. The committee at the time thought that these were sufficiently important to merit a review in a couple of years, a review that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee has now undertaken. The main concern raised with us uh, by committees was the very tight timescale for considering potential subsidiarity issues. While this is very largely beyond the Scottish Parliament's control, we have proposed a couple of changes to make the rules more flexible. Instead of requiring committees to consider issues referred to them, the changes give committees discretion to decide whether they need to and are able in available time to scrutinise a subsidiarity concern that has been raised with them. The changes also mean that committees can reach informal agreement on which is to be the lead committee, rather than having to wait, await a parliamentary bureau uh, designation. Uh, I invite the Parliament to agree these changes, which have been welcomed by the committee, and I have pleasure in moving motion S4M 10244, which reads that the Parliament notes the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee Second Report 2014, Session 4, EU Legislative Proposals, Review of Standing Orders, SP Paper 506, and agrees that the changes to standing orders set out in Annex A of the report to be made with effect from 27th June 2014. Mr Stephen, I am not the only one obliged to you. We now move to decision time. There are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members in relation to this afternoon's debate, if the amendment in the name of Graham Pearson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Margaret Mitchell falls. The first question then is that amendment number 10278.1 in the name of Graham Pearson, which seeks to amend motion number 10278 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on cash back for communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10278.1 in the name of Graham Pearson is as follows. Yes, 31. No, 62. There were 13 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10278.2 
in the name of Margaret Mitchell, which seeks to amend motion number 10278 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on cashback for communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10278.2 in the name of Margaret Mitchell is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 88. There were, no, sorry, there were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10278 in the name of Kenny McCaskill on cashback for communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10284 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the public body's abolition of food from Britain order 2014 UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10243 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on hybrid bills be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10244 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on EU legislation proposals, review standard order to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.